Hey everyone, I'm Jill Martin Brooks and welcome to another edition of She Made It, where we meet some inspiring female founders who are following their dreams and changing their industries in the process. First up, I want to introduce you to a woman making a splash in the swimwear industry. Founder Francesco Aiello is building a brand focused on body confidence. Success doesn't have to be selling a million bathing suits. For me, success is being at a job that I love, that I'm so passionate about. 27-year-old Malibu native Francesca Aiello lives in bikinis. I would literally wake up and go to junior lifeguards, and the second my mom would pick me up, we would go to the beach and go surfing, and I would put my bikini on immediately. She launched her brand, Frankie's Bikinis, in 2012 after discovering a gap in the swimwear market. You love the water, but how did that lead into designing right. bathing suits? I remember seeing a woman on the beach and she was wearing a Brazilian cut bathing suit, but more importantly, her confidence. I was like, I have to get a bathing suit bottom like that, but I couldn't find them. With help from her mom turned business partner, Francesca went in search of these cheeky bikinis, finding the right fabrics and seamstresses to sew her designs. All my girlfriends would come and spend weekends with me as I was getting these tiny bottoms made for myself, and they wanted all my tiny bathing suits. Friends started to take interest in her custom-made suits, so she used social media to get her designs out there. This is like 2012. It was the wild, wild west of social media. I didn't know I was starting a company. I think I knew that while I may not be able to beat our competitors in infrastructure or even sales, I could beat them in social following. All of her posting paid off and eventually caught the eye of a Victoria's Secret supermodel, Candace Swanepoel. So that first big moment was when Candace posted. She tagged us, which nowadays would cost so much money if you wanted something like that. I mean, she reached out for suits. And um, my mom was like, who is this asking for free bathing suits? And I was like, mom, we have to send it to her immediately. And so we did, and she posted about it, and it just took off from there. As Frankie's grew, Francesca knew she needed something besides the cut and designs to set them apart. So she introduced capsule drops, constant small batches of new arrivals to keep customers interested. So who is the Frankie's girl? She is fun, daring, risk-taking for sure. When girls were opening their Frankie's packages in COVID, I wanted to make sure that they felt transported, like they were a part of this Southern California lifestyle in a way. They recently partnered with Gigi Hadid for a summer collection. And in March of this year, Victoria's Secret invested $18 million in Frankie's bikinis and will be selling their suits online. From my first meeting with their team, they were the first people that I, I talked to that were just as passionate about the growth of Frankie's as I am and as my mom is. And, and that was incredibly important to me. Francesca has sold hundreds of thousands of bathing suits to date and just opened her first brick and mortar store in New York City. It seems like you really want to motivate um, young women out there who are motivated by something that might not be the typical path. I think my advice is to just always follow your heart at the end of the day and do what's best for you. I wish I could go back and tell my younger self to be proud of doing something different. Since our segment originally aired, Frankie's Bikinis has teamed up with actresses Sydney Sweeney and Pamela Anderson for two more celebrity collaborations. Up next, more hot businesses from the woman whose company is blowing up to the entrepreneur who built a boutique from scratch. <laughs>
Welcome back to She Made It. Emily Vaca is making waves with her business, Mini Dip. The goal was always to create that perfect Instagrammable moment in your backyard where everything feels complete and you have this staycation. Emily Vaca launched Mini Dip in 2017, selling trendy inflatable pools and other accessories for both kids and adults. And it all started when she was just a kid herself. We had a tiny, small backyard and the stock tank was my pool growing up. That was my happy place. I was actually bullied for my weight. And so going to a public pool or my friend's house for a big pool party was something that made me super uncomfortable. But having that place to create summer memories with my family and, and friends, that's really what made me love the water and start to feel comfortable in my own skin. Don't you wish you could talk to your younger self and just be like, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna make money off of this bullying. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Going through that, that journey of being bullied or, or having those challenges made me want to prove to everyone that I can do it. Those younger years also formed Emily's entrepreneurial side. Both of my parents were creative as, as well. My dad was working three jobs to put me through school. Seeing him do that really helped me build my work ethic. But my mom also was struggling with bipolar disorder and OCD. So, you know, spending time with her, there would be times where she had a bad day. Um, and, you know, was really struggling. As an only child, I really had to step in in those moments and become self-sufficient and really be self-motivated. It was in such a loving environment, but it was very challenging. But I think that building that independence so young really made me know that eventually I really want to depend only on myself and, and really build a life where I have full control. Emily did just that. At the beginning of Mini Dip, she simultaneously worked her full-time job in advertising to help fund her company, even maxing out her credit cards. She dove right in. Emily designed the patterns for her pools and floats, built the sets for her photo shoots, and took pictures of all the products. Her hands-on approach paid off. Within a year of launching Mini Dip, I had a meeting with a Target buyer to be in every Store the following year. I couldn't believe that I hit my biggest goal ever <laughs> that quickly. Today, Mini Dip has gone global, even reaching customers in Australia. And it's made waves with celebrities, including Jessica Alba oh, a mini dip a pool. Mini <laughs> and the Kardashians. Oh my, we have a inflatable mini pool. Everyone was aware of what you were going through and what your family was going through, that they must be so proud of you for turning a situation that was really difficult into something beautiful. My parents always knew that I was so special, always supported me so much, and they are so proud of me. My dad comes up for months at a time to work at Mini Dip, and then my mom, um, she is a natural born salesperson. She goes into the, the Target aisles and will like call strangers over to the mini dip aisle and be like, hey, have you seen these mini dips? That My daughter created these. I would be so embarrassed if I was with her while she was doing this. What do you say to young girls out there who are stuck, who want to get unstuck and say, I have this idea, but I don't know where to start? If you have that big goal in front of you, it keeps all of the challenges kind of in perspective and you have to be ready for all of the, the roadblocks but just to start, you can't have perfection. If you wait until everything's perfect to start any idea, it's never gonna happen. Mini Dip saw a 730% increase in their website traffic the day our She Made It segment aired last August. Now they've sold over a million units. So awesome. All right, next up, an impressive entrepreneur who successfully juggled a growing business and family. Sharice Jones is the founder of Sassy Jones Boutique. If you want to wear your purple with your polka dots and your hot pink, you go for you. it. The only missing ingredient is your confidence. Sharice Jones oozes confidence. I assume when people meet you and buy something from you, they get the energy that you exude. Absolutely. We want you to hold your head up high and walk in your worthiness while you're wearing Sassy Jones and throughout your entire life. Cherise founded Sassy Jones, her fashion and lifestyle brand, 10 years ago. But her love of self-expression really began back when she was just a little girl. I can only imagine you playing dress up. 
Yeah, and you know what? It started with watching the matriarchs in my family, right? Like how they would enter a room, how they went to church, how they put themselves together. And I noticed it was almost a visual vocabulary of how they were feeling on the inside. Charisse taught herself to design statement jewelry and clothing, eventually pursuing a career in marketing. I've sold everything from banking products to food to restaurants, a little bit of everything, okay? But I couldn't scratch my itch. I couldn't find that je ne sais quoi that I was looking for, that kind of fulfillment, that spark. I couldn't find it. Charisse needed to focus on a business that did have that spark, something that married her passion for fashion and strong sales background and the Sassy Jones brand was born. So she decided to quit her nine to five job. But I also simultaneously found out I was pregnant, actually pregnant with twins. I definitely thought about like, hey, this isn't smart. You definitely need your predictable paycheck. You definitely need your health insurance. And just four months after giving birth to her son, she packed her family into their minivan and began selling jewelry from trade show to trade show. And their legs were kicking and swinging in the back seat, and we were driving to Florida, Atlanta, New York, Philly. I did 37 of them in 2016. How many units did you sell during that time? I didn't make any money, Joe. Put my husband in debt, you know, but I did learn who my customer was. And I really became addicted to helping her see herself in a new way through style. But the demands of life on the road became too much for the young family. I was about to give up. But I decided to give it one last go and pivot the business to e-com. And I discovered live stream. Here you go, Facebook. What I love about it is that- I didn't have to leave home. My babies were upstairs sleeping. The first live stream I did, there were 12 people on and I made $600. That's when Sassy Jones took off. The business, which is still 100% family owned, now has 40 employees, a brick and mortar location in Virginia, and the last time we were on Inc. number 24 in Inc. 5000, which puts us as the fastest growing privately held retailer in the nation, who happens to be brown woman owned. Wow. The Sassy Jones woman. Who is she? The Sassy Jones woman is unapologetically bold. So that's where we come in. Like we help her strengthen that muscle of like, hey, you should try a little bit of color. You should try this scarf. You should try those things. What advice do you have because I feel like you can motivate so many entrepreneurs who are their version of in their minivan with the kids crying, with their jewelry running around. It's really trusting your knowing. As women, we tend to look around, ask, well, what do you think? What do you think? And what that practice is doing, it's actually pulling you away from really trusting yourself and listening to that inner voice. We're so busy, the calendar's booked, that we forget to check in with ourselves. And through that knowing, you really know what you're supposed to be doing next. The company has experienced increased traffic in store and online with their popular Miss Beasley clutch completely selling out. All right, still ahead, a founder who's leaving her mark on the holiday card industry. <laughs>
Welcome back to our She Made It special. You're about to meet the entrepreneur behind Minted, a popular card company on a mission to empower independent artists. I just felt like the design I was seeing out there didn't reflect perhaps the talent that was out there. And I really thought that I could make a market. Mariam Nafisi has a knack for spotting fresh design. She's the founder and co-CEO of Minted, the online marketplace most known for its holiday cards and wedding invitations all created from independent artists from around the world. How did Minted come about? So I did grow up overseas. I was in these countries going to bazaars and markets and I think I ended up really loving shopping and <laughs> really loving design. I never thought that I could do that professionally. I never even dared dream that that could become my job. So when was the light bulb moment I thought of this idea where there were artists everywhere who probably couldn't get their goods to market very easily and we wanted to try to level the playing field and make it possible for people to be to be discovered by all of us shoppers who really want great design. Mariam raised funds from friends and family and put her idea into motion. And in 2007, she launched Minted. It started with just building this tiny little community of designers and artists. How we source is really through design competitions and the consumer votes to tell us what they really want to buy. First challenge from her young business, creating save the day cards for weddings. I think we had something like 60 entries. We selected 22 winners from the voting that happened. And I took them to the printer and he said, you know, in this industry, Miriam, nobody puts a photo on their save the day card. No one's gonna want this. Now, maybe 98% of all save the day cards have a photo of the couple. But one year into launching her business, sales were stagnant, and Mariam almost called it quits. The business was failing. Nothing sold at all. And I was about to shut the company down, but we decided to give it another shot. So we then pivoted, became a holiday card company, and our sales absolutely went through the roof that Christmas. So it went from like a completely a nightmare situation to a the Cinderella situation. How many orders did you get? We did about $500,000 in sales in about a month, our first Christmas. It was quite a lot for us. We're a tiny company. We were all sort of sitting on the floors of the office. There weren't enough chairs. For 15 years, Minted has been a leading pioneer in crowdsourcing platforms, staying true to its mission to empower their community of more than 10,000 independent designers. We thought we were going to attract stationary designers. It turns out we were attracting creative group of people who might have a day job doing something completely different. Some of them are um, lawyers, morticians, ice skating coaches, plumbers. Mm -hmm. And then we decided then, this is not a stationary company. This is a design community. These are people who have a passion and a dream inside. So that must have been so gratifying for you to be able to execute that. Yes. The online design marketplace has expanded into art, home decor, and weddings collaborating with stores like Target and West Elm. Today, Minted's products can be found in 75 million homes worldwide. And now, mine. I've never had a holiday card, and I was actually had tears in my eyes when I received something that you made me. What do you think it is about holiday cards that's so important and that has resonated with your consumers? I think it's something that's a tangible representation of a family that lasts for a long, long time. And that's what we think when we make these cards. And that is really special. They're all so beautiful. And the company recently launched Minted Weddings Marketplace, focused on helping customers create memorable, personalized experiences for everyone from their wedding party to their guests. All right, moving on to founder Dion Laszlo Baker and her company, DB's Organic. Being an entrepreneur actually wasn't in my this is what I'm going to be. I went to school to become a PhD and I went to the school of hard enough to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> As a medical scientist, Dion Laszlo Baker studied how exposure to chemicals affected fetal development during pregnancy. But it was her kids who inspired her to leave the science lab. I was in the kitchen one day and our son was making tea, his sister was making popsicles and they were arguing and one of them said, Mommy, let's make teasicles. I kind of went, ping, this is a cool idea. That spark led Dion to launch DB's Organics. Knowing nothing about running a business, she learned from others along the way. One thing as an entrepreneur is to be humble enough to admit when you aren't an expert in something. 
and get the expertise and surround people who are brilliant around you. I love that as advice to entrepreneurs because that knowing what you don't know and being okay with saying that is such a key to success, don't you think? That was probably one of the key things early days it was going out and talking to as many people as I could so that I could understand. I didn't know what a PL statement was. I didn't know what an MC was. Profits and losses. <laughs> She began experimenting in her own kitchen in 2012, but over the years, they stopped making teasicles, ultimately releasing Super Fruit Freezy Pops in 2016. They're made without artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, or added sugar. The fruity treats appeal, put DB's Organics into almost 20,000 stores across North America, including Costco, Walmart, and Kroger. But the journey hasn't been all sweet, especially in the early years when she and her husband poured all their money into the business. One of the pivotal moments you talked about briefly was that your daughter had to buy you groceries and now you're filling the grocery aisles. I mean, definitely you could see the irony in that, but why does that moment stick out for you? I was going through a checkout in our local store. They said, you know, that, that this card doesn't work, that card doesn't work. I had no cash and I'm taking off, you know, okay, let's not buy this, let's not, just the essentials. And I had tears in my eyes because I'm in front of my kids and I'm looking at them like, oh my God, what did I just do to our family? And my daughter says, mom, I'll buy groceries. Just such a hard moment in the evolution. Um, and it just keeps me grounded, I think, today. While she remains grounded in the day-to-day, -day, Dion is also committed to Dream Launcher, a program from DB's Organics for employees to give back to causes they're passionate about with the company offering funding and time off. Dion also supports the dreams of fellow entrepreneurs. As DB's has succeeded, we've been investing in female founders. I do a lot of mentoring for different parts of our communities, from women to women of color, race, gender, ethnicity, religion. That doesn't matter. I really try and help people who might have an otherwise more challenging journey ahead. Her children, who inspired DB's organics more than 10 years ago, are the apple of her eye and the heart of the company. What is your personal driving force to keeping this business going? I want my kids to feel proud. I want them to know that their mom did it and mom persevered. And even when it was really, really, really hard, they began as my barometer of would I be proud to tell them what I'm doing? And, and it's to this day that would I be proud and it would, would it mean something to them. All right, get this. The Day Our She Made It segment aired earlier this year. DB's Organics saw over a thousand percent increase in website clicks on their site. Up next, influencers shaking up the beauty industry. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our She Made It special focused on the best season of the year, summer. Meet founders Mariana Hewitt and Lauren Ireland behind skincare brand Summer Fridays. 
creators, we really know so much about brands because we are marketers. We are the modern day Mary Kay Avon salespeople. Mariana Hewitt and Lauren Ireland are the faces of and brains behind the best-selling skincare brand, Summer Fridays. But before they took the beauty industry by storm, they were at the forefront of social media influencing. So take me back to where you both started. I went to Indiana University, studied broadcast journalism and political science. For the first several years of my career, I was a morning news anchor in Missouri and dreamed of being on the Today <laughs> Show. That was really the dream. I was doing entertainment news and then fashion and beauty. YouTube started around the same time. So I uploaded my first makeup tutorial in 2012. So with the internet, YouTube, Instagram, we could take our own careers into our own hands, create the content we wanted. We didn't have a boss telling us no when we were pitching an idea. It was always the things we wanted to do when we grew up. We just didn't know what platform it would be on. Our parents were like, you went to college to do the internet. By 2014, the friends were full-time content creators, and after years of sharing product reviews with their followers, realized they had the knowledge to create something of their own. We had data of where are they shopping? How much money are they spending? What are they interested in? And they would ask, is this product vegan and cruelty free? And where can we buy this? And so we took all of this information and we jumped up this idea for a skincare line. We would literally just Google various labs, cold call and see what they could create for us. We obviously were new to the business, we were self-funding it. When we're calling these places, a lot of the minimum order quantities were really large, and that's really daunting as a new brand and not knowing if you can sell through that many things. We were able to go with somewhere who said, okay, we can commit to this smaller first run for you. You have to commit to this larger run in time. They decided to launch with just one product, their jet lag mask. You can grab jet lag mask and say, okay, I know the jet lag feeling. I want to feel less tired, and mine was physical jet lag from traveling all over. Lauren's jet lag is a tired mom, mom, mom life jet lag. Right. To launch with a hero item is very, is very rare. A lot of people within the industry recommended against only launching with a single product because it is such a big risk. Financially, it's a lot easier to launch with one product because you're only producing one product. Sephora bet on the founders and debuted the jet lag mask in 2018. We were the first influencer-founded skincare brand at Sephora. Clean, cruelty-free, vegan, sustainable packaging, and that really was a white space for them. And they understood that influencers and that people who have online communities can help drive people into stores. We sold out within less than two weeks, so then it was just trying to get it back in stock. Since then, Summer Fridays has built up a collection of 14 skincare and beauty products, selling nearly 4 million units in just five years. The conversation with your family is from like, what are you doing, yeah. to yeah. where you are now must be really like, we were wrong. Congratulations, <laughs> yeah. guys, right? I think they just are in disbelief of what yeah. we've been able to create for ourselves in the last five years. And like, it just makes me so happy because like we're both children of like, immigrants who came to America who wanted to create these really great lives for themselves. You're making me cry, I just <laughs> did. We're so proud to be able to do that for them and like all the sacrifices they made to get us to where we are today. If they could do it and they moved here with nothing, if they could do it, we, we can do it. Why can't yeah. we do it? What is your advice for girls watching? Don't let fear hold you back. And instead of being, you know, seeing some stories online, be inspired by their stories. Say like, if they can do it, why not me? And we also always say life is long. And so to take your time on things that really matter, think about longevity, really care about what you create and what you do. Well, I want to say that I know you dreamed about being on the Today Show as host, but I'm happy to have you on oh, as two She Made of One of their lip butter bombs has sold every 17 seconds so far this year. Wow. Well, that's all, unfortunately, for our She Made It special today. To shop, scan the QR code, of course, at the bottom of the screen or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Jill Martin Brooks, and I'll definitely see you next time. I mean, I don't even know how fortunate I am to be joined by not one master chef, but two oh, master yes. chefs oh, here heard. in the kitchen. First, it's celebrity chef Jeffrey Zakarian. He's the host of the new Food Network show, Big Restaurant Bed. And of course, Savannah, who has her own cooking show. <laughs> called don't eat that. No, you will get stop sick. It. <laughs> no, don't eat that unless you, you want, have Pepto. I want you to support me on my cooking don't journey. Don't eat like, that. Like oh, GZ does. Yeah, so unless would, a bathroom is nearby. Oh, stop anyway, it. Anyway, Jeffrey, we're so Hi. happy Thank you're you. here. Nice to be here. Are you happy to be in, among the so midst happy. of a chef? I, I love the show, what you're doing, and it's really incredible because it's really hard to teach someone 
like without like getting in there. Like hold I know, your... but the only way to learn is to actually. That's right. Do, do you it. think she could do? Um, could cook this? Absolutely. You ready? We're gonna yeah, do a spring mushroom How do you... pea pasta. Okay. Careful. So slice, be careful. With that. She's like, first pointing all, a knife at me. Don't, well, that's don't just... gesticulate with okay. a knife. That's first thing. Okay. Slice. Okay. Slice. Okay, I'm gonna put some shallots in here with garlic. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple pasta, and I'm making it real time. What do I have first? Pasta is down in the water and it's very salted. So okay. when you want to salt pasta, you want to, it, the water should taste what? like the ocean. Remember, very it's good. Okay. Like Thank you. Okay, water should taste. I'm going to move a little mushroom. closer. The to mushrooms man, are going in here. Okay. Can I okay. help you, Jeffrey? Okay. We'll put those in here. So our mushrooms, shallot, garlic, very simple. Okay. Let them soften. You don't have to be crazy. Just leave it there. Medium. How's my heat. slicing? Fantastic. Oh, oh, because. Savannah. So you want to make sure that they're evenly sliced so they cook and they look like this. Look how oh, I would eat that alone. Okay, Maybe so we're going to add to this some white wine. Go. Mm. Oh. And a little I'm bit of with white wine. pasta water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not all of it, just a little bit. And why pasta water? Because pasta water has all the starch from the pasta. Mm. And guess what? It and helps. You know that silky? Yeah. That silky pasta you get at a restaurant, you don't know why is it so silky. It's yeah. not like that. And that's why. So Can we're going to reduce it. In? Not quite yet because we don't want those to go brown. So these are peas. You could do frozen peas or fresh peas. Okay. If fresh, you could blanch them for a second. But honestly, take right out of the, right out of the freezer. freezer. It's fine. Yeah. Just put them in. Okay. We have our pasta right here, boiling salted water. Mm -hmm. This is the sauce. And people don't understand. So the pasta next to the sauce. And all we do is we take the tongs, we don't throw... Now, I, let me just guess, and, and I'm not a master chef, but this is al dente. Al dente, to the bite, to the bite. Mm. So it's about a minute away from being fully cooked, and we're going to put it in here and just finish it. Oh. How beautiful. In here, and that's how you fit every pasta that you have in a restaurant that you like. Is in the This is how it's done. Yes, it must. So you're just going to give it a little toss. Yeah. Can you do a little toss? Yeah, Be some, okay, some, you know how to do it. Oh, okay. Oh, that's beautiful. Oops. Okay. Sorry, oh y'all. It's all right. Sorry. sorry. Oh, no. Uh, sorry. I'm going to fix it. Watch this. See this? I'm not going to take it off the pasta. Just like this. One, two, three, four. I'm Maybe sorry. You need to cook then the comes the peas. <laughs> then comes... I didn't mean to make such a mess. It's okay. A little cheese. A little that. cheese. <laughs> and because it's a little dry <laughs> and we're missing some, yeah. we're going to add a little bit more exactly. pasta water. Watch this. Just like this. See, All you right? even spill a little, and Just you're a minute. master chef. And then at the very end, a little. some chili. I love oh gosh, chili. Very so finely good. minced chili. And we're ready to go. We're going to add a little basil to it. All okay. right? And you're going to come over here and taste. Your oh. knife skills are excellent. Well, thank you so much. We're going to chiffonade. That's what that's called. And oh. there you have it. We are done. A oh, beautiful God. spring pasta. Be careful. Spring okay, pasta. you try to flip it. Let's see you flip it's it. Hard. And I want to see you're some really, air. What you're doing is you're, not, you're really air. not flipping. You're really just... Folding, so yeah, you fold. just no, no. very small, very okay. small. Okay, why are you giving her tips? Okay, go flip. There you go, much better. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Thank you. I right. learned so much. I'm we'll actually going to say ready. that was great. Come on, I'm going to make it rain some okay. pecorino romano, and this. Yeah, would you like a bite? Mm. Yeah, I would. Here you go. Yum. Right. That looks delicious. What kind of pasta do you use? Uh, fettuccine, mm. uh, it's yeah. a flat pasta, tagliatelle. Okay. Bon appetit. Do you Thank feel like you, you have so to much. make your pasta or no? You don't. Okay. Uh, you can make it, but you really don't have to oh, make okay. it. Possible. Okay, well, don't eat it. You have to read this tag. For this recipe and more, go to today.com slash food. Mm.
It's Make Ahead Monday, <laughs> and it goes green this week. This, these recipes will bring you down to earth. Here to help us veg out is chef and owner of Pig Beach, Matt Abdu. Matt, good morning. Good morning, guys. It's so great to see I know, your faces, we miss even though it's, it's still digitally, but it's wonderful. But we see you. But we see you. That's all that matters. And Indeed. I am so excited because I am obsessed with carrot ginger soup, and I bet your recipe is just like one of the best. Well, I, I truly hope so, but I'm, I'm sure Cal is also going to be able to give me a run for my money. <laughs> very, very few of his culinary adventures. Uh -huh. But the carrot soup is really, it's just absolutely delicious. And believe it or not, you could actually make this recipe using all the scraps from mm. any of the soup or carrots that you might be using for other recipes. Peeling them, save the scraps, any ends or tops or carrots that might be, you know, almost getting to the point in the refrigerator where they're about to uh, go away. Mm -hmm. And since it's Earth Day, we really want to be able to um, just try to find a way of not wasting as much okay. kind of across the board. And that shouldn't just be an Earth Day thing. That should be sure. a year-round thing. Um, so anyway, in my pot over here, we're starting off, we have some carrots that have just been sliced up. We started off with a little bit of vegetable oil and some ginger, garlic, and white onions. And we just put it in our sliced carrots. That's gonna and we're just so going to kind of cook them all until they get a little bit nice and soft. And then to that, we're going to add some vegetable broth. Now, okay. this could also be just plain old water. Hmm. We're going to add our vegetable broth just to cover it. We're going to bring that up to a simmer, and then we're going to add in a little bit of apple cider vinegar. That acid really kind of gives those carrots a nice big pop with that ginger, mm -hmm. brings it all alive with some flavor. And then last but not least, we need a little bit of salt and pepper that are going to go right into that pot. So we're going to bring this up to a simmer, and we're going to cook it for about a half, 20 minutes to a half an hour or so until those carrots are nice and tender. And then they're going to go into our blender ah. once they're all nice and tender, and you're going to end up with this beautiful... Mm -hmm. Creamy Yum. carrot ginger soup. Now, carrots and ginger are like a match made in heaven. They go <laughs> so well together. And that flavor that ginger really brightens up those carrots to mm -hmm. make an incredible soup. And Matt, it would so seem to me that this, this is a soup that could be served either hot or cold. Mm. Absolutely. Why not? It could be sort of in that sort of like uh, you know, gazpacho-esque mm -hmm. style of soup. Cold or, or hot would be de absolutely delicious. But another thing that we're going to use up with our carrots that people throw away all the time and has so much flavor, we're going to make a carrot top pesto to go. Oh, wow. soup. And believe it or not, these carrot tops, they have so much flavor, guys. They have that nice, bright, green, sort of herbaceous flavor to them, but they also still taste like carrots. Uh -huh. So in order to make our carrot pesto, what we're going to do is I've taken the liberty of grabbing the carrot tops. Mm -hmm. You can see right here. Okay. Push this out of the way. I know it's a crazy and question, but what if you don't have blender. the carrot tops? Can you use other things or? That is a great question. If you don't have carrot tops, you can still absolutely make a delicious pesto regardless. Okay. This recipe for pesto will work pretty much across the board. Sub out the carrot tops for basil, and you still have like that traditional basil okay. pesto ready to go. Okay. Um, but the, the, the two key tricks that I love doing when making this pesto is first, I love to blanch my herbs first. Mm -hmm. What that's going to do is it's going to really help set that nice, beautiful green color and keep mm -hmm. them really vibrant throughout the, the processing part. Hey, Matt, and really quickly, could you tell people what blanching is? Absolutely. So blanching is basically taking any sort of vegetable, bringing a pot of salted water to a boil, and then taking that vegetable and putting it into that boiling water to cook it for about 30 seconds or so to either soften it or set those uh, bright green colors. When you're blanching herbs, anything that's green, it's really going to help make those green colors really oh. pop and come alive within the cooking process to keep okay. that nice bright green color. Nice. Cool. Hopefully I like the color of my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have our, so we have our blanched uh, parsley, our blanched carrot tops, our blanched spinach, and that's all gonna go into a pot with a little bit of salt and chili flakes into our blender, excuse me. One clove of garlic. Now this is the part, if you'd like a lot of garlic, you can add a little bit more, but mm -hmm. at one clove, believe it or not, raw garlic is gonna be quite a bit. I have some toasted pine nuts that are gonna go right into our blender. And last but not least, hang on, stuck, stuck in there, is our olive oil. So we're gonna put all this into our blender, mm -hmm. and we're going to put our lid on it. And a great tip, guys, when you're, you're, you're pureeing any sort of green herbs like that, if you want to keep them nice and bright green, put an ice cube in there, believe oh. it or not. The ice cube is actually going to keep those green colors nice and cold because the enemy to keeping anything green is heat. And if it gets too hot because of blending too long, oh. it might turn that army green color, which we don't want. Yeah, mm. So an ice cube in your blender is going to do two things. Oh, yeah. It's going to keep it nice and bright green. It's also going to help emulsify the pesto. So we're going to put it all in our blender and just kind of blend it up real quick. You get the point. And then when it comes time, it gets all nice and creamy smooth. We're just going to take our last little bit 
of Parmesan cheese. Ooh. And we're just going to oh, fold it into it this that's incredible, that. beautiful, oh, that looks green amazing. pesto. Oh, my so goodness. So now we're going to bring it all together, well, guys. Matt, we've got to go, unfortunately. Uh, but you've got also right. on our website some great recipes for what you can do with leftover broccoli and cauliflower as well. Yum. Absolutely. Don't waste anything, guys. Use it all up. It is super delicious. Don't waste a thing of it. I'm so All awesome. right, Matt. Thank, thank you, Matt. you so much. Cool. All right, you coming bet, up guys. next. Great seeing you. Happy Earth Day. All Happy right, Earth Day. Thanks so much, Matt. In this morning's Make Ahead Monday, we have a double header packed with spring veggies. So here to help is host of Food Network's Worst Cooks in America, our friend, Chef Ann Burrell. And good morning. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for having me and happy spring. Yay. Happy spring. I love this because I love stew. I love making stew. But I mean, in this time of year, I feel like it's kind of off limits, but you're changing the game here. Well, I mean, I always love a veggie anytime. And the more I can get the, the beautiful green spring colors, that's what, just what I'm talking about. So I have a bunch of veggies. I have sugar snap peas. I have asparagus. I have zucchini and escarole. I have some spring onions that I'm sauteing mm -hmm. in my pan. And um, my veggies, I have blanched in salted boiling water. And then I am letting them chill out in salty ice water. And then I have the little spring onions that I'm starting to saute in my pan. I'm adding to that some, some new potatoes, some red list potatoes that have been um, boiled as well. We're just going to get this all sauteed together. So we get the potatoes in there, and then we start adding the veggies Why do you this. like blanching so the veggies before spring. instead of just sauteing them with everything? So I blanch and shock them to get them cooked through, and then you shock them to stop the cooking <laughs> and set that beautiful green color. And um, so then when we saute in the pan, it's mm -hmm. really just about bringing everything together. Mm -hmm. I know you, so you've got some asparagus. And, uh, I, but, I love asparagus. But, but could you use any grouping of green veggies you wanted? Anything you want. If you don't like asparagus, skip it. If you're not a sugar snap pea fan, you can skip those too. If you want to use English peas, those work just as well. Um, so I have some zucchini that I'm throwing in there. The zucchini I'm just throwing in. I have not blanched and shocked that. Um, and we just get everybody mm, sauteed so together. Yummy. Right? And then we finish it with a little bit of escarole. And throw in a little bit of chicken stock just to get everybody to come together. There we go. Mm, all right. We give it a little sprinkle of salt. And just for fun, a little crushed red pepper. Oh, I like nice. a little spice in there. Mm -hmm. And then we finish the whole thing with just a little bit of butter mm. and Parmesan cheese that it kind of helps hold everybody together. So it's almost like a warm cooked salad. Yes, exactly. And this goes, this is great for things with like grilled chicken mm -hmm. or roasted chicken and, and or if, you if want you've to got do... if you've got leftovers and you could you say you can turn it into a frittata so i and that's exactly what i did i took my leftover spring veggie stew and i just uh beat up about six eggs and uh about a half a cup of parmesan cheese um i got that all in a pan finished mm -hmm. it in the oven and then topped it with a little uh salad and some some bread wow. and like wow. the whole thing then is like it could be just a beautiful spring side dish or it could be a lovely brunch or like, you know, hors d'oeuvres, that kind of thing. And that's great at room temperature. Oh, wow. What's the secret to, to the frittata not getting the bottom too brown but making sure the top cooks? I, I've always had trouble. So, right, I know. It's like you start it on the stove and when you see the eggs start to cook and sort of hold their shape, I just tossed the whole pan right in the oven. So about 350 degrees for about 15 minutes, just till the eggs are cooked through and voila, there you go. Boom. So good. I, want, I just want it. I want food back. <laughs> right, <laughs> and right. thank you so much. That looks delicious. Mm. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. And don't forget to turn it, tune in to Worst Cooks on Sunday nights at 9 o'clock. Absolutely, on the Food Network. And, of course, for these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. And we'll be right back.
It is time for Tasty Trends Tuesday, and today's trend, eating less meat. Even if it's just one night a week, a lot of families are trying to help the earth by choosing a more eco-friendly option. Okay, but we didn't want just any meatless <laughs> no. meal on our show, so we called up Stefano Secchi. He's the chef behind <laughs> one of the hottest restaurants in New York City. I've been. It's delish. Resdora. And we asked him to make us something wonderful. Hey, Stefano. Look at Stefano. Hi, guys. I'm excited to be here. How are you doing? Stefano, we like that little snack. Yeah, you're making us feel, like, happy. <laughs> just showing That's up. That's because, because one like Luca's around, so like the only way to get him out of a complete rage is to dance with him. So in, well, after we're done with the segment, I'm going to go dance with him a little bit, and it's going to be great. Well, and Luca, Luca's my little. Luca, yeah, your two-year-old son, and you've oh, been making right. cooking it's, classes with him, cooking yeah. videos. Yep, yep, oh, I yep, hear yep, him. yep. He, uh, <laughs> he actually loves it. We can hear him. We hope he makes a cameo. Wait, there uh, is Luca. What does he like to cook? Uh, um, he, he lo like he just loves to eat, really. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he loves to salt things. It's fantastic. I mean, we're off to a good start. You know? That's pretty uh, cool. I think. All right, He's so actually yelling at me right now. for those of, uh, of us who haven't had the privilege of eating at your restaurant, you're about to make us something delicious. Tell us what you're going to make. Okay, so we always do a seasonally gnocchi, and it's for brunch. We're going to do a pea gnocchi here, um, and we're just, what I've done is I'm just going to take over real quick, if you, if you don't mind. What I've done is just taken uh, potatoes, and you always want to have potatoes that are a little bit older, and low in moisture, because the idea is to get the moisture out uh, when you're making the gnocchi, so you can add less flour. So what I do is I bake the potatoes off, and you see the steam that's escaping. You want uh -huh. to cut them in half right away, okay? Okay. And then you're going to send them through a ricer. I have this ricer that I've had in my family for years from Italy, and I, I just I can't get away from it. It's great. Oh. Um, and it actually just goes onto a wooden cutting board. And then I take some, you know those frozen peas that you have yes. that you use to, you know, I mean, if you got a headache or yes. like Ice everyone sprains joint. their ankle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so just use one of those if, if, you, if you have frozen fresh peas inside the, the fridge. What I did is I took like this really beautiful orange egg yolk. I don't know if you guys can see oh, yes. that, but it's like dark, dark orange. We get beautiful eggs here um, from upstate New York. Wow. And I actually add them to the uh, to the peas. Just take an immersion blender and then you just blend the two together. OK. And then what I've done is I put off to the side um, some of the uh, some of the pea puree and that's going to actually get added right inside of the ah. potato. Right. So you're going to have like the basis of pea. Yeah. Of pea gnocchi. So during the winter time, we did squash. Um, we've done spinach. <clears throat> you want to take, as soon as you've done that, you're going to take just a, a regular. I think we call this just a, a plastic <laughs> you know, bench scraper is what we call yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> bench scraper in, at the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then you want to take that and you want to take uh, just the flour and you're going to sift it on top. And is that just normal flour? And yeah. Uh, we use double diddle, but you can use AP flour absolutely. So cool. you're going to, to bring the dough together, you sift all the flour on top so you don't have any really lumps, and you're going to bring the dough together with a bench scraper, okay? Slowly like this. So you have the egg yolk in there to help bind it together, and I've got, and I've got the finished dough right here, okay? So you I'm going to show you just okay. how we roll out this gnocchi. Yeah. That's you it. You guys with me so far? I know, we were I'm saying shocked that it's Wait. hard to make homemade pasta, but Wait. that looks easy. So it's potato yes. and flour? Potato flour, and, and then yeah, just the, the pea. Peas. You don't have to use the pea if you don't want. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Okay, so now what are we doing with it? Okay, so we're, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna roll it out into into a log. Okay, you want to have the, the reason why you want to do it on a cutting board is because it may be a little bit a little bit wet, and when that happens, if that if that happens, it adds just a little bit of bench flour you have off to the side here, uh -huh. so you can easily get the shape that you're looking for. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is. Cut, cut them into gnocchi. little uh -huh. gnocchi balls. Right. Yeah. And so at the restaurant, you know, we go through so many gnocchis. But I used, we usually have, you either use a, a gnocchi board or just the tines of a, of a fork. Yeah. Uh -huh. So dip the fork inside of a little bit of flour. Take that gnocchi. You want to push it down. Okay. Roll it. Roll it. And, into yeah. We're gonna, and we roll it. And you want to you have the tines of the fork actually showing... I've done a few ahead of time for you guys, and I'm going to actually put this right in the boiling salted water. Okay. Can oh. I ask something? Did and you we're going to make the, the sauce. Did you do the fork thing just for aesthetic, so it looks cute? Could you just plop them in if you wanted? That's actually a great question. So, yeah, it, in many ways, yeah. My nonna used to just cut them like this, and then she used to just put them in the in the yeah. boiling water as is. But you actually have this little indention when you when you when you push it with on the tines of the fork that holds onto the sauce really well. Oh, hold so on. that's why I, I use the uh, mm -hmm. the tines of the fork. Anyway. 
Um, so it's it, whatever you want to do, or just come to Resdora and we'll make it for you as well. <laughs> All that right, so let me just show you the style. sauce real quick. Uh -huh. Yeah, is this uh, the sauce, sauce is going to be. Yeah, so we're doing so we have a pea puree on the base, but we have just a very very simple butter. Or if you don't use, want to use butter, you can use extra virgin olive oil. But I have a little bit of butter right here because media Romagna, we use a nice amount of butter. Uh -huh. Okay. I have my gnocchi that have just been dropped in. I'm going to make sure. That as soon as it starts floating, they're ready to go. But you see that those peas that we used to have in the in the bag, or uh -huh. we have fresh frozen peas as well, which are really really nice. Yeah. Or just go to the farmer's market across the way, and you can get them there too. It's gonna go right inside with the butter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys with me? This is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> I, during this whole COVID thing, we've been so excited to have spring come again. I mean, it's just been yes. so excited. Yeah, so, so we're going crazy with the peas. We're going crazy with peas right now. Okay, so if you want to come in here, let me show you the gnocchis are floating right now. Oh, okay. And they have I'm to float. That means they're done. And then you just pour them right in that sauce. Exactly right. Okay. Going right inside the sauce right now. Okay. So you want to have a little bit of pasta water as well. Oh, I see how you do okay. that. Uh-huh. Should we show us that final product? Oh, that looks yummy. Right now, you got it. We want it. We wish it was here. Is all I can tell you. I'm gonna send some to you, Jenna. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget about me. Yes, hold and you on. hold it. You hold it. Me. Sorry, sorry. Of course, both of you. Too. Both of you. Uh, of course, both of you. Luca's actually gonna try and eat this. Luca, viene qua. Luca. Luca, do you want a bite? Hot Luca. Okay, so we have the pea puree. We have the fresh oh. pea gnocchi. Okay. Will you just give us a flash yeah, to the camera because we got us? Because sadly, it's all over. Yeah, we want more. You're a little bit. You're a little out of frame, but let's see if we can. Let's see. There oh, you go. Beautiful. That's a beauty. Tell Luca to blow My first. My camera woman's going to fire me after this. Thank she's, right. she's, uh, All right. Yummy. She's like, yeah. Beautiful. Delicious. Oh. Tell her we said thank you. Yes. Uh, you recipes. got it. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys so much for having us. Thanks, guys. See you soon. And for these ciao, recipes, ciao. head to today.com slash food. Of course, it's Friday. That means it's Superfood Friday. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer sharing two delicious egg recipes that will have you scrambling to make them this weekend. <laughs> I'm going to love it. Hey, guys. I love eggs so much, and I'm excited to share with you two healthy, excellent recipes for your weekend brunch plans. First up, a veggie cheese frittata that is packed with the good stuff. I'm starting here with a dozen eggs. The majority are whole eggs, just mixed up right here, but I always like to take a few of the yolks out. Next, I'm adding in a half a cup of light sour cream. I'm all about the herbalicious flavor. You can put in whatever herbs you like. I have here chopped dill and parsley, a quarter teaspoon kosher salt, and a little bit of pepper. And I'm just gonna mix this up and now we are ready to build our frittata. I'm using onions and bell pepper. This is the point where you can make this frittata your own. And it's really important to use an oven safe skillet because when we make a frittata, it goes from stovetop right into the oven. 
This will saute over a medium flame for about five to seven minutes. We just wanna get the veggies nice and soft and lightly browned. I'm adding in some mushrooms too. I'll let this saute for another five to seven minutes. Sprinkle on top, I have some 2% sharp cheddar cheese. Slowly, I'm gonna pour my egg mixture over the cheese, which is over the vegetables. Many layers of scrumptiousness. And let this sit over the flame for about three to five minutes. Now I put the remaining cheese on top and I'm gonna let it sit over the medium flame for about three to five minutes. I just want these outer edges to slightly firm up and cook, and then I'm gonna transfer it right into the oven set at 350 for about 20 minutes. And here's our masterpiece. Guys, every bite is filled with protein, fiber, and yummy satisfaction. Now we're elevating egg salad to OMG status by giving it a cacio e pepe spin. So here I have a dozen and eggs hard boiled, some of them are whole, and a few of them I lost the yolks. And I'm just gonna chop them up using my fork. So this is nice and mixed. And now I'm adding in some light mayo. And of course, Parmesan, the star of the show. I'm gonna mix this up. And you'll see it's all coming together rich and creamy and luxurious. And to add a pop of color and some nutrition, I chopped up a bell pepper and I'm gonna add it right in. But of course, we need the ground black pepper. I tend to put in about one teaspoon, but you can continue to sort of add the pepper and taste. I like to enjoy it on a bed of leafy greens, some whole grain crackers or toast. Guys, this is good. Here's to an extra special weekend. <laughs> That looks I, I, delicious. I'm telling you that, and and the frittata is just one of the great because you can take anything that's yes. in the fridge. Leftovers. I've had like leftover green beans, and I've just thrown yeah. them in a frittata. That's really tasty, yeah. and that looks terrific. So, uh, for more on these recipes, why don't you go to today.com/food. Welcome to The Boost. Today we are stepping out of the studio. Jenna and I headed over to Brooklyn where we became street artists for a day. Check it out. It's the splash of colors that have been part of New York's landscape for decades. But while graffiti used to be seen as a symbol of vandalism and disarray, it has now emerged as a vital art form with businesses sponsoring vibrant murals and works even being featured in museums and galleries. And with tours and workshops now available to all, we decided to give it our best shake. I have faith in them that they'll be able to use the spray paint. So as long as their nails are not too long, we should be able to spray this can. We met graffiti artist Alex Santos in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You know what's funny? People, when they think of graffiti, they think like a can of paint, shake it up, write something. This is the opposite of that. This is a real art form. It's a, a form of self-expression. There's no wrong way to express yourself. Graffiti, you say, actually was a healing force for you. Yes, so growing up, it was either join the gangs in the streets or escape with the art crew, and it was more that my realm because I had the talent. Who was the first person who said, Alex, you got something? My mom. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. Alex was raised by a single mom in the Bronx. We heard that she used to check your backpack to make sure you didn't have paint sometimes. Yeah, usually I had the bag shaken up and I was trying to sneak out that house and go express myself. Yeah. But she tried to force me to just keep it in the books. But by the way, now what does she think? <laughs> yeah. Well, she's actually very surprised that I have my dream job. Today, Alex is an art instructor and street tour guide for Graph Tours, which allows visitors to try graffiti for themselves. But the coolest thing is you are living your dream. Yes. You're a working artist. What does it feel like? 
Uh, it's amazing to show people the different perspective of the graffiti because the common misconception is we're just vandals destroying the, the world, destroying the community, but depending on the picture you put and how you paint it, you can be building the community. And then Alex did his best to turn us into graffiti artists. Hoda and Jenna need to know how to just express themselves. We should be able to come up with a, a masterpiece at the end of the time we have. Is that a cartoon? Is that a dog? Wait, you just did Snoopy? Snoopy! Hoda. Amazing. Hoda and Jenna actually surprised me. They actually pulled out a Snoopy out of nowhere. That was pretty cool. Clean lines. Okay. How was that? Amazing. Good. Try it. Try it. It's harder okay. than it looks. You got it. There you did, right away. I'm kind of into it. He taught us How the basics of spraying. Same distance. Yes, yes. Clean. She's good. It's still legible, now we fill it in. Oops. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> then we got started on our masterpiece. Stay inside the lines, just like a coloring book. How about this, no? Yes, nice and fast. It shouldn't take oh, too fast. long on Stop one Stop waiting. waiting, Stop waiting. Might drip a little, but that's part of it, right? That's part of the part of the graffiti. As we learned, the secret is just to use the right amount of paint. What about the drip? You like a drip? I like a drip. Yeah, we don't like the drip. It could make the piece look a little bit messy, but if that's the style you're going for, then there's nothing wrong with it. It's about expressing yourself. She probably wanted to be a little drippy. It's fine. Drippy drip. Hoda uses the perfect amount of paint. I don't mind the drip. You do today. Okay, but I don't want it to be too drippy. Just light. Yeah. Done. Yep. There you Put go. Further there away. Go. Spreads further the paint away. evenly. Yes. Let's go, go, mama. Less is more. Less is yes, you got more. it. There you go. Less yes is more. A grade out of like one to ten, I'd probably give Hoda and Jenna like a seven and a half, maybe. There's some things we could have sped up on or slowed down on. We had fun. to another young street artist making the city a more beautiful place, one sign at a time. From the corner of this Brooklyn coffee shop, Mika's, a 24-year-old artist feverishly putting pen to pad, redesigning the city streets incognito. Color combinations, good fonts. Earlier this year, Max Kolomatsky was stuck in a creative rut, but found inspiration in the collage of slapdash ads taped to light posts and storefront windows. Most of them you don't even notice. And honestly, that's a pretty telltale sign that it could use some work. And so for fun, he started drawing life into those lackluster signs. If a sign can catch your eye, that's the difference between you knowing about something and you not knowing about something. It started with a flyer for game night, and then ads for refrigerator and stove work, a handyman, even a band. Printing and posting his new and improved versions next to the originals. Why do it anonymously, incognito? I really like imagining somebody coming back to their sign, and there's one right next to it with the same information, but just professionally designed. I think it's just a uh, poof. An element of surprise. An element of surprise, yes. He shared his process on social media and captivated millions with his Spider-Man-esque effort. Were you surprised by the response to your initial videos? Absolutely. I had no idea it would be um, at the scale that it is now. And for the first time... Hey, how's it going? Kolomotsky presented his signs to a small business in person. I drew wow. these out if you're interested. It didn't take long for Eric Bautista to swap out the signs for his family's one-year-old business, El Camado. Gives hope in, in people that people still do care about other ones. An artist's touch, inspiring hope, one stroke at a time. Emily Iketa, NBC News, New York.
Welcome back to the boost. Summer's almost here and out in California, they are gearing up for fire season. And this year, to help prepare, they're calling in some adorable surprise experts. Take a look. After three years of punishing drought, Mother Nature drenched California this past winter, bringing to life landscapes that have been dry, cracked, and parched. But with all this beauty will eventually come a beast. Wildfire season is just around the corner and will be fueled with the rampant growth of grass, brush, and trees brought on by record atmospheric rivers. So officials are now leaning on unique solutions to fight fire with... What are these goats doing? These goats are uh, doing fuels abatement. Since 2013, Tim Aerosmith and his herd of 4,000 goats have been chewing up fire prone areas like this one in West Sacramento, where Parks Operations Superintendent Jason Popolo puts them to good use. So, why goats? There's a lot of areas that are very hard to reach in terms of getting down into thick brush, deep hollows, riverbanks that is difficult for my staff in terms of safety equipment they can use. They'll go through and basically act as a mower, if you will. They'll chew it all the way down to the ground. These goats, all females, will consume three acres in a day. And since they're not picky eaters, they'll mow down vegetation that other grazing animals can't reach. If the city needs fire mitigation, they've done it for years using human hands, using machinery, why should they contract you? What I can accomplish with a set of goats in a given day puts to shame what a hand crew or a mow crew or a weed eating crew can do. These goats work all the time. The only time they stop working is when the sun goes down and it's dark and they lay around and chew their cud. The herds start grazing in March through October and then take a break in the winter to give birth to a whole new class of kids. And how many areas do you do? We will move about 150 times this summer, probably about six different groups of goats, and they'll be doing fire mitigations for homeowners associations, uh, forestry, um, cities, municipalities, utilities, private owners. They're like eating candy right now, and they'll move to the next best thing, the next best thing, and finally they'll take down the less desirable grasses, shrubs. How do you keep them on the job, focused and, and moving in the areas that you need to move? They start paying attention to this herder right here, and when they finish it, they get real noisy. And they start telling him, we're done, we want to move. Okay. And he knows that, and he'll have his next paddock built, and he'll open it, and they just flood through. The goats are now a destination for many. That's the biggest success. Every year we have the public asking, when are the goats coming back? Because they're out there visiting them, watching them with their kids. Tim says home is wherever his goats are. He grew up loving animals on a ranch in Northern California, but spent 15 years at a desk job in the mortgage business. I was 50 and I went, what do I want to do different? And I thought, wow, if they're going to pay me to graze my goats, what a gig. And I went to Oregon and I picked up 10 goats and came home and it's grown from there. Is this sort of like this full circle moment? It, it really is. You know, I started out farming and ranching. We worked hard. Uh, at the time, we didn't like it. You know, it was hot. It was work. It taught us a work ethic. It taught us business. Will you have more work because of all the rain and there's more vegetation? Some of the producers are saying we haven't seen fire fuels like this in 20 years three and four feet of fuel down south. So yeah, they're gonna be busy. Happy goats though. Happy goats. <laughs> now we wanna introduce you to a woman working to enhance the lives of those in need. And I think it's safe to assume the furry friends at our animal sanctuary would say she is the real goat. Some people may ask like, why do we need a place for special needs goats? And I really think that the message is teaching acceptance and inclusion. My name is Leanne Loricella and I am the founder of Goats of Anarchy, which is a farm animal sanctuary and we specialize in goats with special needs. Currently we have around 126 goats, but we also have sheep, alpacas, cows, donkeys, horses, chickens, 
pigs. So altogether, we're getting around 200 animals. We have burn victims who lost their feet in fires. We have a lot of frostbite victims who lost their legs when they were first born. We have a lot of neurological disorders. We have about 10 blind goats. And we have goats that had injuries or came from abuse cases. So we have a lot of different things and we are learning as we go. And there's no handbook for this. They do go through that moment of trials that they have to get through in their first couple of months of life. But then with us and the help of prosthetics and wheelchairs, they go on to live a full and happy life with goats that are just like them. It is a 24-7 life. I keep the most severe cases in the house with me. There are a lot of sleepless nights. I wanna say I've given things up, but the reward is so much better that I don't feel like I've given things up. Someone reached out to me through social media. They told me about two baby goats. They were twins and one of them was born with a deformity and she was missing her back leg. Her twin brother had contracted front legs so they were kind of bent when he walked. And it was my first time working with a special needs animal and Lila couldn't walk, she couldn't stand. So helping her learn to stand and then walk and then run. It was very inspirational to me. Come on. When I first started, I knew nothing. I had a goat with no back legs and I started researching and there's obviously at this time there was nothing for goats with no back legs. So I started looking at dogs and I saw that they made wheelchairs for dogs. So I thought, okay, so I called a company and I ordered a wheelchair for a dog and it worked great. Then I had another frostbite victim and missing both back legs and I started looking into prosthetics. I had seen something before with an animal with prosthetics and contacted someone who mostly did dogs and it worked great. And now we have probably around 30 goats that wear prosthetics. We have seven or eight goats that have wheelchairs. These aren't your typical farm animals where you open the door, they go out, they eat, and they're fine for the rest of the day. In the mornings, we start the routine of getting everyone dressed. So the little goats that have the prosthetics on need to have socks put on. They need to have their prosthetic devices put on, and it does take a little bit of time, usually about an hour just to get everyone, everyone's feet on. And then they're all you know, put outside, and then at night, everything has to go in reverse. So we have to put them back in their stalls, take their prosthetic devices off, take their socks off, get them out of their wheelchairs. A lot of our wheelchair goats have special beds that we have made for them to keep them up off the floor and it keeps them clean. We're very fortunate to work with a vet who understands that we are different from the typical farmer. Hi, buddy. We've worked with vets in the past who just say, you need to euthanize, what kind of life is this? Or you need to euthanize, like why would you want to spend money on a farm animal? Love to help goats that would not have a chance otherwise because I became a veterinarian to help animals. A lot of the stuff we do is routine, vaccines, health checks, things like that. For something like here, this is more than the routine and it's why I became a veterinarian and I enjoy the challenge. And what you can do is you can pull the splint off and leave the bandage on. I really love to see the transformation. We do have some heartbreaks, which really is not fun at all. But for every heartbreak we have, we have so many success stories. We support each other and that's all we can ask is to try our best for everybody. And a lot of them just need a little bit of care and it makes a huge difference. So that's like the coolest thing. Like we put a lot of time and energy and money into him, but for some of these, they just need a prosthetic and a little bit of like special feeding and care. And it's so nice to have a place like this that can do that.
I think that what our goats teach people is not to give up. We're really good at feeling sorry for ourselves. We are afraid of being different. And when people look at these little goats who don't care and they're just living their life without legs and their wheelchairs, I think that they're incredibly inspiring. And I think that they really encourage people to just be inclusive of other people and to be more accepting of other people and themselves. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. Um, I joke and tell my staff I'm going to be here until I'm 95 and I'm going to be in a wheelchair with all my goats in Lawson's barn. This is the most fulfilled I've ever been in my life and I know that this is where I'm supposed to be. the boost with one of our favorites, Harry Smith. An Irish storyteller is called a Shanike, and we know one who claims McSorley's Old Ale House is the longest continuously operating bar in New York City since 1854, if you can believe it. <laughs> Ever since then, the bar has been a place to shed your woes, meet your friends, and share a cup or two. What's a best night like here? When this place is at its best. What is it like to be inside this room? I hate, this sounds really corny. It's a kind of heaven. It's like you're surrounded by throngs of really wonderful human mirth. Bart Bartholomew knows. He spent just a few rounds shy of 50 years behind the bar here, where he says most patrons heed the establishment credo. Be good or be gone. There's something about it. You're, you're in the middle of a hive, I guess, of human warmth and good cheer and everything. And that's great. Many a Saturday morning, Bart would bring his little boy to McSorley's. So entranced by the goings-on was Rafe Bartholomew, he vowed one day he'd work here too. And then he wrote a book about it. What makes this place different from other old bars in town? For me, it's that the place has, still runs as much as possible like it did when John McSorley opened it in 1854. The way they serve the ale, the sawdust on the floors, the chairs, the tables, the bar itself. The stuff on the walls, milestones, memories, history, some enough to give you pause. So what, what is this up here? Um, these are our World War I wishbones. We consider that the most precious uh, artifacts in the bar. You know, in 1917, a group of, you know, regular guys, mostly locals from the neighborhood, were shipping out to World War I, and they had a going-away party here. At the end of the night, 
they each hung a wishbone on the gas lamp for good luck in the hopes that they would come back. After the war, those who survived came back and took down a wishbone. And those who never made it, their wishbones have been there ever since. McSorley's devotion to the past is steadfast. As was true when the bar first opened, your choice of drink is ale, light or dark. Imagine an Irish bar that serves no whiskey. Light or dark? No Jamesons, no, no. No Bushmills? No Bushmills, no, no. You, you. No Tullamore Dew? No, no, not, you're getting into good stuff. No. <laughs> there is an enduring and endearing stubbornness here. When Matthew Marr became the bar's third owner in the 1970s, he pledged to keep it the same. His daughter Teresa runs it now and continues the commitment to forswear, fad, or fashion. How proud are you of this place? Oh, I'm, I'm very proud. Like, I'm beyond words. It's more than a bar. It, it's like history. It's my family. It's life. I think this place, you know, teaches all of us something, especially that work here. Like Bart, who quite honestly spent most of his life here. You always want to have some kind of meaning or significance to your life. And it's here for me. After loving my wife and my son and being a good father and good husband, this place is like, it's the meaning of my life. And now, sometimes dreams do come true. Jenna and I got an invitation to an exclusive first look at the new pop-up Malibu Barbie Cafe. And you know we had to say yes. Welcome to Barbie Girls Summer. Hi, Barbie. The internet-breaking Barbie movie is set to hit the big screens in July, and it will be pink pandemonium. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Barbie, you're beautiful. The iconic doll first took the world by storm in 1959. Malibu Barbie. Then, in 1971, Mattel introduced Malibu Barbie, and of course, Malibu Ken was right by her side. Since then, there's been many iterations of Barbie, including Hoda and Savannah's one-of-a-kind Shiro doll in 2018. We have a Barbie! It's a cultural Barbie obsession I know all too well. I played Barbies till I was like 22. I was a Barbie addict as a uh, child. Barbara and I would fight over Ken as our husbands. So Hoda and I were bursting when we got the chance to be the first two visitors at the real life Malibu Barbie Cafe in downtown Manhattan. Wow. It's a Malibu Barbie Cafe. I wish you had all 27 of your Barbies with us. <laughs> it was California beach vibes all around. And we took full advantage of every photo opportunity. Say Barbie. Barbie. I feel like we're Kinda in like we're California. There. That was a good one. Look like these are meant for someone <laughs> much smaller. Our heads are too large. <laughs> when you walk in, you are definitely transformed to another place. Well, this is all inspired by Barbie's permanent residence, Malibu. It's such a fun, spirited 70s beach vibe that it really transports people. You gotta get below the wave. You're too high. <laughs> Ow! Get How down. Get down, like get down <laughs> baby, get down. <laughs> Woo! It strikes me how she stood the test of time. Yeah. So what's happening in the world around us is reflected in the brand. We hope that every child sees something of themselves in the doll. Yeah, I mean, representation matters. Mattel partnered with the experience company, Bucket Listers, to create the pop-up cafe, which opens to everyone on Wednesday. Okay. Oh. Should we go to the Barbie beach? Come on, girl. Hey, let's take a selfie. Okay. Is that our Barbie talk? Is this real sand? I think oh, yeah. so. They flew oh, it in God. from Malibu. Now we can look like we're actual Barbies. Like, okay, ready? I'm gonna <laughs> shake it like a Polaroid picture. Oh my Ooh, God, Polaroid. old school. How would Barbie stand? You like, Erect, but casual, <laughs> like a catalog. Being Barbie is hard work, and we worked up quite the appetite. Good thing executive chef Becky Brown was nearby with her Barbie-inspired menu. Malibu Barbie is all about like fresh, beautiful, delicious mm. cuisine. And in true Barbie fashion, some of the cafe's menu items had a little extra sparkle. Let me show you this one. This is one of my favorites. Oh. This is the Today's the Day Parfait. Is this Today's for the is it? Hey. <laughs> Today's the Day. We do a little bit of coconut yogurt, some fresh fruit, 
some glitter because wait, Barbie. Wait, what is oh, that? So it's a glitter sugar. Wait, did you see that? Wow, Look. that's very cool. Oh the glitter. God. The glitter, cinnamon glitter, sugar glitter. And of course, awesome. Barbie eats glitter. Becky, you killed it. Thank you, Becky. Yeah. This was oh so my good. God. Jenna may not leave. No, I actually am going to set up a little <laughs> cot. I might sleep out on the beach yeah. under the stars. Hi, Barbie. We are back here on the boost with that one last feel good moment to keep you smiling all day long. You're going to love this fourth grader. His name is Liam. He was unable to attend school all last year due to a rare autoimmune disorder, but his class surprised him last week by throwing him a big end of the year party. Check it out. Everyone was there to welcome him back his classmates, his teachers, cheering him on. They ordered some pizzas. He was a little nervous to see everybody again, but the girl in the red sweatshirt says, it's okay, come, come join us, come join us, which he did. It's been such a fun show for you guys. Uh, keep the good energy flowing. We'll be back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Hey everyone, I'm Jill Martin Brooks, and welcome to another edition of She Made It where we meet some inspiring female founders who are following their dreams and changing their industries in the process. First up, I want to introduce you to a woman making a splash in the swimwear industry. Founder Francesco Aiello is building a brand focused on body confidence. Success doesn't have to be selling a million bathing suits. For me, success is being at a job that I love, that I'm so passionate about. 27-year-old Malibu native Francesca Aiello lives in bikinis. I would literally wake up and go to junior lifeguards, and the second my mom would pick me up, we would go to the beach and go surfing, and I would put my bikini on immediately. She launched her brand, Frankie's Bikinis, in 2012 after discovering a gap in the swimwear market. You love the water, but how did that lead into designing right. bathing suits? I remember seeing a woman on the beach and she was wearing a Brazilian cut bathing suit, but more importantly, her confidence. I was like, I have to get a bathing suit bottom like that, but I couldn't find him. With help from her mom turned business partner, Francesca went in search of these cheeky bikinis, finding the right fabrics and seamstresses to sew her designs. All my girlfriends would come and spend weekends with me as I was getting these tiny bottoms made for myself and they wanted all my tiny bathing suits. Friends started to take interest in her custom-made suits, so she used social media to get her designs out there. This is like 2012. It was the wild, wild west of social media. I didn't know I was starting a company. I think I knew that while I may not be able to beat our competitors in infrastructure or even sales, I could beat them in social following. All of her posting paid off and eventually caught the eye of a Victoria's Secret supermodel, Candace Swanepoel. So that first big moment was when Candace posted. She tagged us, which nowadays would cost so much money if you wanted something like that. I mean, she reached out for suits 
And um, my mom was like, who is this asking for free bathing suits? And I was like, mom, we have to send it to her immediately. And so we did and she posted about it and it just took off from there. As Frankie's grew, Francesca knew she needed something besides the cut and designs to set them apart. So she introduced capsule drops, constant small batches of new arrivals to keep customers interested. So who is the Frankie's girl? She is fun, daring, risk-taking for sure. When girls were opening their Frankie's packages in COVID, I wanted to make sure that they felt transported, like they were a part of this Southern California lifestyle in a way. They recently partnered with Gigi Hadid for a summer collection. And in March of this year, Victoria's Secret invested $18 million in Frankie's bikinis and will be selling their suits online. From my first meeting with their team, they were the first people that I, I talked to that were just as passionate about the growth of Frankie's as I am and as my mom is. And, and that was incredibly important to me. Francesca has sold hundreds of thousands of bathing suits to date and just opened her first brick and mortar store in New York City. It seems like you really want to motivate um, young women out there who are motivated by something that might not be the typical path. I think my advice is to just always follow your heart at the end of the day and do what's best for you. I wish I could go back and tell my younger self to be proud of doing something different. Since our segment originally aired, Frankie's Bikinis has teamed up with actresses Sydney Sweeney and Pamela Anderson for two more celebrity collaborations. Up next, more hot businesses from the woman whose company is blowing up to the entrepreneur who built a boutique from scratch. <laughs> Welcome back to She Made It. Emily Vaca is making waves with her business, Mini Dip. The goal was always to create that perfect Instagrammable moment in your backyard where everything feels complete and you have this staycation. Emily Vaca launched Mini Dip in 2017, selling trendy inflatable pools and other accessories for both kids and adults. And it all started when she was just a kid herself. We had a tiny, small backyard, and the stock tank was my pool growing up. That was my happy place. I was actually bullied for my weight, and so going to a public pool or my friend's house for a big pool party was something that made me super uncomfortable. But having that place to create summer memories with my family and, and friends, that's really what made me love the water and start to feel comfortable in my own skin. Don't you wish you could talk to your younger self and just be like, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna make money off of this bullying. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Going through that that journey of being bullied or, or having those challenges made me want to prove to everyone that I can do it. Those younger years also formed Emily's entrepreneurial side. Both of my parents were creative as well. My dad was working three jobs to put me through school. Seeing him do that really helped me build my work ethic. 
but my mom also was struggling with bipolar disorder and OCD. So, you know, spending time with her, there would be times where she had a bad day um, and, you know, was really struggling. As an only child, I really had to step in in those moments and become self-sufficient and really be self-motivated. It was in such a loving environment, but it was very challenging. But I think that building that independence so young really made me know that eventually I really want to depend only on myself and, and really build a life where I have full control. Emily did just that. At the beginning of Mini Dip, she simultaneously worked her full-time job in advertising to help fund her company, even maxing out her credit cards. She dove right in. Emily designed the patterns for her pools and floats, built the sets for her photo shoots, and took pictures of all the products. Her hands-on approach paid off. Within a year of launching Mini Dip, I had a meeting with a Target buyer to be in every store the following year. I couldn't believe that I hit my biggest goal ever <laughs> that quickly. Today, Mini Dip has gone global, even reaching customers in Australia. And it's made waves with celebrities, including Jessica Alba. Oh, a mini dip pool. <laughs> and the Kardashians. Oh my, we have a inflatable mini pool. Everyone was aware of what you were going through and what your family was going through, that they must be so proud of you for turning a situation that was really difficult into something beautiful. My parents always knew that I was so special, always supported me so much, and they are so proud of me. My dad comes up for months at a time to work at Mini Dip, and then my mom, um, she is a natural born salesperson. She goes into the, the Target aisles and will like call strangers over to the Mini Dip aisle and be like, hey, have you seen these Mini Dips? That My daughter created these. I would be so embarrassed if I was with her while she was doing this. What do you say to young girls out there who are stuck who want to get unstuck and say, I have this idea, but I don't know where to start. If you have that big goal in front of you, it keeps all of the challenges kind of in perspective and you have to be ready for all of the, the roadblocks. But just to start, you can't have perfection. If you wait until everything's perfect to start any idea, it's never going to happen. Mini Dip saw a 730% increase in their website traffic the day our She Made It segment aired last August. Now they've sold over a million units. So awesome. All right, next up, an impressive entrepreneur who successfully juggled a growing business and family. Sharice Jones is the founder of Sassy Jones Boutique. If you want to wear your purple with your polka dots and your hot pink, you go for you. it. The only missing ingredient is your confidence. Sharice Jones oozes confidence. I assume when people meet you and buy something from you, they get the energy that you exude. Absolutely. We want you to hold your head up high and walk in your worthiness while you're wearing Sassy Jones and throughout your entire life. Sharice founded Sassy Jones, her fashion and lifestyle brand, 10 years ago. But her love of self-expression really began back when she was just a little girl. I can only imagine you playing dress up. Yeah, and you know what? It started with watching the matriarchs in my family, right? Like how they would enter a room, how they went to church, how they put themselves together. And I noticed it was almost a visual vocabulary of how they were feeling on the inside. Sharice taught herself to design statement jewelry and clothing, eventually pursuing a career in marketing. I've sold everything from banking products to food to restaurants, a little bit of everything, okay? But I couldn't scratch my itch. I couldn't find that je ne sais quoi that I was looking for, that kind of fulfillment, that spark. I couldn't find it. Sharice needed to focus on a business that did have that spark, something that married her passion for fashion and strong sales background and the Sassy Jones brand was born. So she decided to quit her nine to five job. But I also simultaneously found out I was pregnant, actually pregnant with twins. I definitely thought about like, hey, this isn't smart. You definitely need your predictable paycheck. You definitely need your health insurance. And just four months after giving birth to her sons, she packed her family into their minivan and began selling jewelry from trade show to trade show and their legs were kicking and swinging in the back seat, and we were driving to Florida, Atlanta, New York, Philly. I did 37 of them in 2016. How many units did you sell during that time? 
I didn't make any money, Joe. Put my husband in debt, you know, but I did learn who my customer was. And I really became addicted to helping her see herself in a new way through style. But the demands of life on the road became too much for the young family. I was about to give up, but I decided to give it one last go and pivot the business to e -com. And I discovered live stream. Here you go, Facebook. What I love about it is and that- I didn't have to leave home. My babies were upstairs sleeping. The first live stream I did, there were 12 people on it. I made $600. That's when Sassy Jones took off. The business, which is still 100% family owned, now has 40 employees, a brick and mortar location in Virginia, and- The last time we were on Inc. number 24 at Inc. 5000, which puts us as the fastest growing privately held retailer in the nation who happens to be brown woman owned. Wow. The Sassy Jones woman, who is she? The Sassy Jones woman is unapologetically bold. So that's where we come in. Like we help her strengthen that muscle of like, hey, you should try a little bit of color. You should try this scar. You should try those things. What advice do you have? Because I feel like you can motivate so many entrepreneurs who are their version of in their minivan with the kids crying, with their jewelry running around. It's really trusting your knowing. As women, we tend to look around, ask, well, what do you think? What do you think? And what that practice is doing, it's actually pulling you away from really trusting yourself and listening to that inner voice. We're so busy, the calendar's booked, that we forget to check in with ourselves. And through that knowing, you really know what you're supposed to be doing next. The company has experienced increased traffic in store and online with their popular Miss Beasley clutch completely selling out. All right, still ahead, a founder who's leaving her mark on the holiday card industry. Welcome back to our She Made It special. You're about to meet the entrepreneur behind Minted, a popular card company on a mission to empower independent artists. I just felt like the design I was seeing out there didn't reflect perhaps the talent that was out there. And I really thought that I could make a market. Mariam Nafisi has a knack for spotting fresh design. She's the founder and co-CEO of Minted, the online marketplace most known for its holiday cards and wedding invitations all created from independent artists from around the world. How did Minted come about? So I did grow up overseas. I was in these countries going to bazaars and markets and I think I ended up really loving shopping and <laughs> really loving design. I never thought that I could do that professionally. I never even dared dream that that could become my job. So when was the light bulb moment I thought of this idea where there were artists everywhere who probably couldn't get their goods to market 
very easily. And we wanted to try to level the playing field and make it possible for people to be, to be discovered by all of us shoppers who really want great design. Mariam raised funds from friends and family and put her idea into motion. And in 2007, she launched Minted. It started with just building this tiny little community of designers and artists. How we source is really through design competitions and the consumer votes to tell us what they really want to buy. First challenge from her young business, creating save the day cards for weddings. I think we had something like 60 entries. We selected 22 winners from the voting that happened. And I took them to the printer and he said, you know, in this industry, Miriam, nobody puts a photo on their save the day card. No one's gonna want this. Now, maybe 98% of all save the day cards have a photo of the couple. But one year into launching her business, sales were stagnant and Miriam almost called it quits. The business was failing, nothing sold at all. And I was about to shut the company down, but we decided to give it another shot. So we then pivoted, became a holiday card company, and our sales absolutely went through the roof that Christmas. So it went from like a completely a nightmare situation to a the Cinderella situation. How many orders did you get? We did about $500,000 in sales in about a month, our first Christmas. It was quite a lot for us. We're a tiny company. We were all sort of sitting on the floors of the office. There weren't enough chairs. For 15 years, Minted has been a leading pioneer in crowdsourcing platforms, staying true to its mission to empower their community of more than 10,000 independent designers. We thought we were going to attract stationary designers. It turns out we were attracting creative group of people who might have a day job doing something completely different. Some of them are um, lawyers, morticians, ice skating coaches, plumbers. Mm -hmm. And then we decided then, this is not a stationary company. This is a design community. These are people who have a passion and a dream inside. So that must have been so gratifying for you to be able to execute that. Yes. The online design marketplace has expanded into art, home decor, and weddings collaborating with stores like Target and West Elm. Today, Minted's products can be found in 75 million homes worldwide. And now, mine. I've never had a holiday card, and I was actually had tears in my eyes when I received something that you made me. What do you think it is about holiday cards that's so important and that has resonated with your consumers? I think it's something that's a tangible representation of a family that lasts for a long, long time. And that's what we think when we make these cards. And that is really special. They're all so beautiful. And the company recently launched Minted Weddings Marketplace, focused on helping customers create memorable, personalized experiences for everyone from their wedding party to their guests. All right, moving on to founder Dion Laszlo Baker and her company, DB's Organic. Being an entrepreneur actually wasn't in my this is what I'm going to be. I went to school to become a PhD and I went to the school of hard knocks to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> As a medical scientist, Dion Laszlo Baker studied how exposure to chemicals affected fetal development during pregnancy. But it was her kids who inspired her to leave the science lab. I was in the kitchen one day and our son was making tea, his sister was making popsicles and they were arguing and one of them said, Mommy, let's make teasicles. I kind of went, ping, this is a cool idea. That spark led Dion to launch DB's Organics. Knowing nothing about running a business, she learned from others along the way. One thing as an entrepreneur is to be humble enough to admit when you aren't an expert in something and get the expertise and surround people who are brilliant around you. I love that as advice to entrepreneurs because that knowing what you don't know and being okay with saying that is such a key to success, don't you think? That was probably one of the key things early days was going out and talking to as many people as I could so that I could understand. I didn't know what a PL statement was. I didn't know what an MCB Profits and is. losses. <laughs> She began experimenting in her own kitchen in 2012, but over the years, they stopped making teasicles, ultimately releasing Superfruit Freezy Pops in 2016. They're made without artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, or added sugar. The fruity treats appeal put DB's Organics into almost 20,000 stores across North America, including Costco, Walmart, and Kroger. But the journey hasn't been all sweet. 
especially in the early years when she and her husband poured all their money into the business. One of the pivotal moments you talked about briefly was that your daughter had to buy you groceries and now you're filling the grocery aisles. I mean, definitely you could see the irony in that, but why does that moment stick out for you? I was going through a checkout in our local store. They said, you know, that this card doesn't work, that card doesn't work. I had no cash and I'm taking off, you know, okay, let's not buy this, let's not, just the essentials. And I had tears in my eyes because I'm in front of my kids and I'm looking at them like, oh my God, what did I just do to our family? And my daughter says, mom, I'll buy groceries. Just such a hard moment in the evolution. Um, and it just keeps me grounded, I think, today. While she remains grounded in the day-to-day, -day, Dion is also committed to Dream Launcher, a program from DB's Organics for employees to give back to causes they're passionate about with the company offering funding and time off. Dion also supports the dreams of fellow entrepreneurs. As DB's has succeeded, we've been investing in female founders. I do a lot of mentoring for different parts of our communities, from women to women of color, race, gender, ethnicity, religion. That doesn't matter. I really try and help people who might have an otherwise more challenging journey ahead. Her children, who inspired DB's organics more than 10 years ago, are the apple of her eye and the heart of the company. What is your personal driving force to keeping this business going? I want my kids to feel proud. I want them to know that their mom did it and mom persevered. And even when it was really, really, really hard, they began as my barometer of would I be proud to tell them what I'm doing? And, and it's to this day that would I be proud and it would, would it mean something to them. All right, get this. The Day Our She Made It segment aired earlier this year. DB's Organics saw over a thousand percent increase in website clicks on their site. Up next, influencers shaking up the beauty industry. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our She Made It special, focused on the best season of the year, summer. Meet founders Mariana Hewitt and Lauren Ireland behind skincare brand Summer Fridays. Being creators, we really know so much about brands because we are marketers. We are the modern day Mary Kay, Avon salespeople. Mariana Hewitt and Lauren Ireland are the faces of and brains behind the best-selling skincare brand Summer Fridays. But before they took the beauty industry by storm, they were at the forefront of social media influencing. So take me back to where you both started. I went to Indiana University, studied broadcast journalism and political science. For the first several years of my career, I was a morning news anchor in Missouri and dreamed of being on the Today <laughs> Show. That was really the dream. I was doing entertainment news and then fashion and beauty. YouTube started around the same time. So I uploaded my first makeup tutorial in 2012. So with the internet, YouTube, Instagram, we could take our own careers into our own hands, create the content we wanted. We didn't have a boss telling us no when we were pitching an idea. It was always the things we wanted to do when we grew up. We 
just didn't know what platform it would be on. Our parents were like, you went to college to do the internet? Yes. By 2014, the friends were full-time content creators, and after years of sharing product reviews with their followers, realized they had the knowledge to create something of their own. We had data of where are they shopping, how much money are they spending, what are they interested in, and they would ask, is this product vegan and cruelty free, and where can we buy this? And so we took all of this information and we jumped up this idea for a skincare line. We would literally just Google various labs, cold call, and see what they could create for us. We obviously were new to the business, we were self-funding it. When we're calling these places, a lot of the minimum order quantities were really large, and that's really daunting as a new brand and not knowing if you can sell through that many things. We were able to go with somewhere who said, okay, we can commit to this smaller first run for you. You have to commit to this larger run in time. They decided to launch with just one product, their jet lag mask. You can grab jet lag mask and say, okay, I know the jet lag feeling. I want to feel less tired, and mine was physical jet lag from traveling all over. Lauren's jet lag is a tired mom, mom, mom life jet lag. Right. To launch with a hero item is very, is very rare. A lot of people within the industry recommended against only launching with a single product because it is such a big risk. Financially, it's a lot easier to launch with one product because you're only producing one product. Sephora bet on the founders and debuted the jet lag mask in 2018. We were the first influencer-founded skincare brand at Sephora. Clean, cruelty-free, vegan, sustainable packaging, and that really was a white space for them. And they understood that influencers and that people who have online communities can help drive people into stores. We sold out within less than two weeks, so then it was just trying to get it back in stock. Since then, Summer Fridays has built up a collection of 14 skincare and beauty products, selling nearly 4 million units in just five years. The conversation with your family is from like, what are you doing, yeah. to yeah. where you are now must be really like, we were wrong. Congratulations, <laughs> yeah. guys, right? I think they just are in disbelief of what yeah. we've been able to create for ourselves in the last five years. And like, it just makes me so happy because like we're both children of like, immigrants who came to America who wanted to create these really great lives for themselves. You're making me cry, I just did. <laughs> yeah. We're so proud to be able to do that for them and like all the sacrifices they made to get us to where we are today. If they could do it and they moved here with nothing, if they could do it, we, we can do it. Why can't yeah. we do it? What is your advice for girls watching? Don't let fear hold you back and instead of being, you know, seeing some stories online, be inspired by their stories. Say like, if they can do it, why not me? And we also always say life is long and so to take your time on things that really matter. Think about longevity, really care about what you create and what you do. Well, I want to say that I know you dreamed about being on the Today Show as host, but I'm happy to have you on oh, as two She Made of Founders. One of their lip butter bombs has sold every 17 seconds so far this year. Wow. Well, that's all, unfortunately, for our She Made It special today. To shop, scan the QR code, of course, at the bottom of the screen or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Jill Martin Brooks, and I'll definitely see you next time. I mean, I don't even know how fortunate I am to be joined by not one master chef, but two oh, master yes. chefs oh, here heard. in the kitchen. First, it's celebrity chef Jeffrey Zakarian. He's the host of the new Food Network show, Big Restaurant Bed. And of course, Savannah, who has her own cooking show. <laughs> called don't eat that. No, you will get stop sick. It. <laughs> no, don't eat that unless you, you want, have Pepto. I want you to support me on my cooking don't journey. Don't eat like, that. Like oh, GZ does. Yeah, so unless would, a bathroom is nearby. Oh, stop anyway, it. Anyway, Jeffrey, we're so Hi. happy Thank you're you. here. Nice to be here. Are you Thanks. happy to be in, among the midst so of a chef? I, I love the show, what you're doing, and it's really incredible because it's really hard to teach someone. Like without like getting in there, like hold I know, your... but the only way to learn is to actually. That's right. Do, do you think she could do? Um, could cook this? Absolutely. You ready? We're gonna yeah, do a ready. spring mushroom How do you... pea pasta. Okay, careful. so slice. be careful. With that. She's like, first pointing all, a knife at me. Don't, well, don't just... gesticulate with okay. a knife. That's first thing. Okay, okay slice. Slice. Okay, I'm gonna put some shallots in here with garlic. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a very simple pasta, and I'm making it real time. What do I have first? Pasta is down in the water and it's very salted. So okay. when you want to salt pasta, you want to, it, the water should taste what? like the ocean. Remember, very it's good. Okay. Like Thank you. Okay, water Add should taste. I'm going to move a little mushroom. closer. To the my mushrooms hand, are going in here. Okay. Can I okay. help you, Jeffrey? Okay. We'll put those in here. So our mushrooms, shallot, garlic, very simple. Okay. Let them soften. You don't have to be crazy. Just leave it there. Medium. How's my heat. slicing? Fantastic. Oh, oh, because. Savannah. So you want to make sure that they're evenly sliced so they cook and they look like this. Look how so I would eat that alone. Okay, Maybe so we're going to add to this some white wine. Go. Mm. Oh. 
and a little bit of with white wine? pasta water. Okay. Not all of it, just a little bit. Why a pasta water? Because pasta water has all the starch from the pasta. And guess what? It and helps. You know that silky? Yeah. That silky pasta you get at a restaurant, you don't know why is it so silky. It's yeah. not like that. And that's why. So Can we're going to reduce it. it. Not quite yet because we don't want those to go brown. So these are peas. You could do frozen peas or fresh peas. Okay. If fresh, you could blanch them for a second. But honestly, take <laughs> right out of the... Right out of the freezer, freezer. it's not? fine. Yeah. Just put them in. Okay, we have our pasta right here, boiling salted water. Mm -hmm. This is the sauce, and people don't understand. So the pasta next to the sauce, and all we do is we take the tongs. We don't throw. Now, I, let me just guess, and, and I'm not a master chef, but this is al dente. Al dente to the bite, to the bite. Mm -hmm. So it's about a minute away from being fully cooked, and we're gonna put it in here and just finish it. Oh, how beautiful! In here, and that's how you fit every pasta that you have in a restaurant that you like. Is in the This is how it's done. Yes, it must. So you're just going to give it a little toss. Yes. Give it, can you do a little toss? Yeah, okay, some, okay. You know how to do it. Oh, okay. Whoa, oh, that's beautiful. Oops. Okay. Sorry, oh y'all. It's all right. Sorry. Right. Oh, no. Uh, sorry. I'm going to fix it. Watch this. See this? I'm not going to take it off the pasta. Just like this. One, two, three, four. I'm Maybe sorry. You need to cook then the comes the peas. <laughs> Then comes. I didn't mean to make such a mess. It's okay. A little cheese. A little that. cheese. <laughs> and because it's a little dry, <laughs> and we're missing some. Yeah. We're gonna add a little bit more exactly. pasta water. Watch this. Just like this. See, All you right? even spill a little, and Just you're a minute. master chef. And then at the very end, a little. Some chili. I love oh gosh, chili. Very so finely good. minced chili. And we're ready to go. We're gonna add a little basil to it. All okay. right. And you're gonna come over here and taste. Your oh. knife skills are excellent. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> we're gonna chiffonade. That's what that's called. And oh. there you have it. We are done. A oh, beautiful God. spring pasta. Be careful. Spring okay, pasta. you try to flip it. Let's see you flip it's it. Hard. And I want to see you're some really, air. What you're doing is I you're, not, see you're really air. not flipping. You're really just folding. So yeah, you fold. just no, no. very small. Very okay. small. Okay, why are you giving her tips? Okay, go flip. There you go. Much better. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Thank you. I've right. learned so much. I'm we'll actually going to say that was great. Come on, I'm going to make it rain some okay. Pecorino <laughs> Romano. And this yeah, would you like a bite? Mm. Yeah, I would. Here you go. Yum. Yeah. That looks delicious. What kind of pasta do you use? Uh, fettuccine, mm. uh, it's yeah. a flat pasta, tagliatelle. Okay. Bon appetit. Do you feel Thank like you, you have so to much. make your pasta or no? You don't. Okay. Uh, you can make it, but you really don't have to oh, make okay. pasta. Okay. Well, oh, don't eat it. You have to read this tag. For this recipe and more, go to today.com slash food. Mm. Make Ahead Monday, and it goes green this week. This, these recipes will bring you down to earth. Here to help us veg out is chef and owner of Pig Beach, Matt Abdu. Matt, good morning. Good morning, guys. It's so great to see I know, your faces, even though it's, it's still digitally, but it's wonderful. But we see you. But we see you. That's all that matters. And Indeed. I am so excited because I am obsessed with carrot ginger soup, and I bet your recipe is just like one of the best. Well, I, I truly hope so, but I'm, I'm sure Cal is also going to be able to give me a run for my money. <laughs> I'm very, very with his culinary adventures. But the carrot soup is really, it's just absolutely delicious. And believe it or not, you could actually make this recipe using all the scraps from any of the soup or carrots that you might be using for other recipes. Peeling them, save the scraps, any ends or tops or carrots that might be 
you know, almost getting to the point in the refrigerator where they're about to uh, go away. Mm -hmm. And since it's Earth Day, we really want to be able to uh, just try to find a way of not wasting as much okay. kind of across the board. And that shouldn't just be an Earth Day thing. That should be sure. a year round thing. Um, so anyway, in my pot over here, we're starting off. We have some carrots that have just been sliced up. We started off with a little bit of vegetable oil and some ginger, garlic, and white onions. And we just put it in our sliced carrots. That's gonna and we're just so going to kind of cook them all until they get a little bit nice and soft. And then to that, we're going to add some vegetable broth. Now, okay. this could also be just plain old water. Mm. We're going to add our vegetable broth just to cover it. We're going to bring that up to a simmer. And then we're going to add in a little bit of apple cider vinegar. That acid really kind of gives those carrots a nice big pop with that ginger. Mm -hmm. Brings it all alive with some flavor. And then last but not least, we need a little bit of salt and pepper that are going to go right into that pot. So we're going to bring this up to a simmer. And we're going to cook it for about a half, 20 minutes to a half an hour or so until those carrots are nice and tender. And then they're going to go into our blender ah. once they're all nice and tender. And you're going to end up with this beautiful, mm. creamy Yum. carrot ginger soup. Now, carrots and ginger are like a match made in heaven. They go <laughs> so well together. And that flavor of that ginger really brightens up those carrots and mm -hmm. make an incredible soup. And Matt, it would so seem to me that this, of, this is a soup that could be served either hot or cold. Mm. Absolutely. Why not? It could be sort of in that sort of like uh, you know, gazpacho s mm -hmm. style soup. Cold or, or hot would be del absolutely delicious. But another thing that we're going to use up with our carrots that people throw away all the time and has so much flavor, we're going to make a carrot top pesto to go oh, wow. soup. And believe it or not, these carrot tops, they have so much flavor, guys. They have that nice, bright, green, sort of herbaceous flavor to them, but they also still taste like carrots. So okay. in order to make our carrot pesto, what we're going to do is I've taken the liberty of grabbing the carrot tops. Mm -hmm. You can see right here. Okay. Push this out of the way. I know it's a crazy and question, but what if you don't have blender. the carrot tops? Can you use other things or? That is a great question. If you don't have carrot tops, you can still absolutely make a delicious pesto regardless. Okay. This recipe for pesto will work pretty much across the board. Sub out the carrot tops for basil, and you still have like that traditional basil okay. pesto ready to go. Uh, okay. um, but the, the, the two key tricks that I love doing when making this pesto is first, I love to blanch my herbs first. Mm -hmm. What that's going to do is it's going to really help set that nice, beautiful green color and keep mm -hmm. them really vibrant throughout the, the processing part. Hey, Matt, and really quickly, could you tell people what blanching is? Absolutely. So blanching is basically taking any sort of vegetable, bringing a pot of salted water to a boil, and then taking that vegetable and putting it into that boiling water to cook it for about 30 seconds or so to either soften it or set those uh, bright green colors. When you're blanching herbs, anything that's green, it's really going to help make those green colors really oh. pop and come alive within the cooking process to keep okay. that nice bright green color. Nice. Cool. Hopefully I like the color of my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have our, so we have our blanched uh, parsley, our blanched carrot tops, our blanched spinach, and that's all going to go into a pot with a little bit of salt and chili flakes into our blender, excuse me. One clove of garlic. Now, this is the part if you like a lot of garlic, you can add a little bit more, but mm -hmm. at one clove, believe it or not, raw garlic is going to be quite a bit. I have some toasted pine nuts that are going to go right into our blender. And last but not least, hang on, stuck, stuck in there, is our olive oil. So we're going to put all this into our blender. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put our lid on it. And a great tip, guys, when you're, after you're, you're puring any sort of green herbs like that, if you want to keep them nice and bright green, put an ice cube in there, believe it or not. The ice cube is actually going to keep those green colors nice and cold because the enemy to keeping anything green is heat. And if it gets too hot because of blending too long, uh, it might turn that army green color, which we don't want. Yeah, so an ice cube in your blender is going to do two things. Oh, yeah. It's going to keep it nice and bright green. It's also going to help emulsify the pesto. So we're going to put it all in our blender and just kind of blend it up real quick. You get the point. And then when it comes time, it gets all nice and creamy smooth. We're just going to take our last little bit of Parmesan cheese, Ooh. and we're just going to oh, fold it into this it incredible, that. beautiful, oh, that green amazing. pesto. Oh, my and goodness. Even so now we're going to bring it all together, well, guys. Matt, we've got to go, unfortunately. Uh, but you've got also right. on our website some great recipes for what you can do with leftover broccoli and cauliflower as well. Yum. Absolutely. Don't waste anything, guys. Use it all up. It is super delicious. Don't waste the thing of it. I'm so All awesome. right, Matt. Thank, thank you, you Matt. so much. Cool. All right, you coming bet, up guys. next. Great seeing you. Happy Earth Day. Oh, Happy bye -bye. Earth Day. Thanks so much, Matt. In this morning's Make Ahead Monday, we have a double header packed with spring veggies. So here to help is host of Food Network's Worst Cooks in America, our friend, Chef Ann Burrell. And good morning. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for having me and happy spring. Yay. Happy spring. I love this because I love stew. I love making stew. But I mean, in this time of year, I feel like it's kind of off limits, but you're changing the game here. Well, I mean, I always love a veggie anytime. And the more I can get the, the beautiful green spring colors, that's what, what I'm talking about. 
So I have a bunch of veggies. I have sugar snap peas. I have asparagus. I have zucchini and escarole. I have some spring onions that I'm sauteing mm -hmm. in my pan. And um, my veggies, I have blanched in salted boiling water. And then I am letting them chill out in salty ice water. And then I have a little spring onions that I'm starting to saute in my pan. I'm adding to that some, some new potatoes, some red list potatoes that have been um, boiled as well. We're just gonna get this all sauteed together. So we get the potatoes in there and then we start adding the veggies. Mm -hmm. Why do you this. like so blanching the veggies before spring. instead of just sauteing them with everything? So I blanch and shock them to get them cooked through and then you shock them to stop the cooking <laughs> and set that beautiful green color. And um, so then when we saute in the pan, it's mm -hmm. really just about bringing everything together. Mm -hmm. I know you, so you've got some asparagus. And, uh, right, but, I love asparagus. But, but could you use any grouping of green veggies you wanted? Anything you want. If you don't like asparagus, skip it. If you're not a sugar snap pea fan, you can skip those too. If you want to use English peas, those work just as well. Um, so I have some zucchini that I'm throwing in there. The zucchini I'm just throwing in. I have not blanched and shocked that. Um, and we just get everybody mm, sauteed so together. Mm. Right? And then we finish it with a little bit of escarole and throw in a little bit of chicken stock just to get everybody to come together. There we go. Mm, all right. We give it a little sprinkle of salt. And just for fun, a little crushed red pepper. Oh, I like nice. a little spice in there. Mm -hmm. And then we finish the whole thing with just a little bit of butter mm. and Parmesan cheese that it kind of helps hold mm. everybody together. So it's almost like a warm cooked salad. Yes, exactly. And this goes, this is great for things with like grilled chicken mm -hmm. or roasted chicken and, and or if, you if, want you've to got, do... if you've got leftovers and you could you say you can turn it into a frittata so i that's exactly what i did i took my leftover spring veggie stew and i just uh beat up about six eggs and uh about a half a cup of parmesan cheese um i got that all in a pan finished mm -hmm. it in the oven and then topped it with a little uh salad and some some bread wow. and like wow. the whole thing then is like it could be just a beautiful spring side dish or it could be a lovely brunch or like you know hors d'oeuvres that kind of thing and that's great at room temperature oh, wow. what's the secret to, to the frittata not getting the bottom too brown but making sure the top cooks I, i've always had trouble so right i know it's like you start it on the stove and when you see the eggs start to cook and sort of hold their shape I just tossed the whole pan right in the oven. So about 350 degrees for about 15 minutes, just till the eggs are cooked through and voila, there you go. Boom. So good. I, want, I just want it. I want food back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. thank you so much. That looks delicious. Mm. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. And don't forget to turn it, tune in to Worst Cooks on Sunday nights at 9 o'clock. Absolutely, on the Food Network. And, of course, for these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. And we'll be right back.
It is time for Tasty Trends Tuesday, and today's trend, eating less meat. Even if it's just one night a week, a lot of families are trying to help the earth by choosing a more eco-friendly option. Okay, but we didn't want just any meatless <laughs> no. meal on our show, so we called up Stefano Secchi. He's the chef behind <laughs> one of the hottest restaurants in New York City. I've been. It's delish. Resdora. And we asked him to make us something wonderful. Hey, Stefano. Hi, Stefano. Hi, guys. I'm excited to be here. How are you doing? Stefano, we like that little snack. Yeah, you're making us feel, like, happy. <laughs> just showing That's up. That's because, because one like Luca's around, so like the only way to get him out of a complete rage is to dance with him. So in, well, after we're done with the segment, I'm going to go dance with him a little bit, and it's going to be great. Well, and Luca, Luca's my little. Luca, yeah, your two-year-old son, and you've oh, been making right. cooking it's, classes with him, cooking yeah. videos. Yep, yep, oh, I yep, hear yep, him. yep. He, uh, <laughs> he actually loves it. We can hear him. We hope he makes a cameo. Wait, there uh, is Luca. What does he like to cook? Uh, um, he, he like he just loves to eat, really. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he loves to salt things. It's fantastic. I mean, we're off to a good start. You know? That's pretty uh, cool. I think. All right, He's so actually yelling at me right now. for those of, uh, of us who haven't had the privilege of eating at your restaurant, you're about to make us something delicious. Tell us what you're going to make. Okay, so we always do a seasonally gnocchi, and it's for brunch. We're going to do a pea gnocchi here, um, and we're just, what I've done is I'm just going to take over real quick, if you, if you don't mind. What I've done is just taken uh, potatoes, and you always want to have potatoes that are a little bit older, and low in moisture, because the idea is to get the moisture out uh, when you're making the gnocchi, so you can add less flour. So what I do is I bake the potatoes off, and you see the steam that's escaping. You want uh -huh. to cut them in half right away, okay? Okay. And then you're going to send them through a ricer. I have this ricer that I've had in my family for years from Italy, and I, I just I can't get away from it. It's great. Oh. Um, and it actually just goes onto a wooden cutting board. And then I take some, you know those frozen peas that you have yes. that you use to, you know, I mean, if you got a headache or yes. like Ice everyone sprains joint. their ankle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so just use one of those if, if, you, if you have frozen fresh peas inside the, the fridge. What I did is I took like this really beautiful orange egg yolk. I don't know if you guys can see oh, yes. that, but it's like dark, dark orange. We get beautiful eggs here um, from upstate New York. Wow. And I actually add them to the uh, to the peas. Just take an immersion blender and then you just blend the two together. OK. And then what I've done is I put off to the side um, some of the uh, some of the pea puree and that's going to actually get added right inside of the ah. potato. Right. So you're going to have like the basis of pea. Yeah. Of pea gnocchi. So during the winter time, we did squash. Um, we've done spinach. <clears throat> you want to take, as soon as you've done that, you're going to take just a, a regular. I think we call this just a, a plastic <laughs> you know, bench scraper is what we call yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> bench scraper in, at the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. So then you want to take that and you want to take uh, just the flour and you're going to sift it on top. And is that just normal flour? And yeah. Uh, we use double diddle, but you can use AP flour absolutely. So cool. you're going to, to bring the dough together, you sift all the flour on top so you don't have any really lumps, and you're going to bring the dough together with a bench scraper, okay? Slowly like this. So you have the egg yolk in there to help bind it together, and I've got, and I've got the finished dough right here, okay? So you I'm going to show you up. just okay. how we roll out this gnocchi. Yeah. That's you it. You guys with me so far? I know, we were I'm saying shocked that it's Wait. hard to make homemade pasta, but Wait. that looks easy. So it's potato yes. and flour? Potato flour, and, and then yeah, just the, the pea. Peas. You don't have to use the pea if you don't want. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Okay, so now what are we doing with it? Okay, so we're, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna roll it out into into a log. Okay, you want to have the, the reason why you want to do it on a cutting board is because it may be a little bit a little bit wet, and when that happens, if that if that happens, it adds just a little bit of bench flour you have off to the side here, uh -huh. so you can easily get the shape that you're looking for. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is. Cut them into gnocchi. little uh -huh. gnocchi balls. Right. Yeah. And so at the restaurant, you know, we go through so many gnocchis. But I used, we usually have you either use a, a gnocchi board or just the tines of a, of a fork. Yeah. Uh -huh. So dip the fork inside of a little bit of flour. Take that gnocchi. You want to push it down. Okay. Roll it. Roll it. And, into yeah. A... We're gonna, and we roll it. And you want to you want to have the tines of the fork actually showing. I've done a few ahead of time for you guys, and I'm going to actually put this right in the boiling salted water. Okay. Can oh. I ask something? Did and you we're going to make the, the sauce. Did you do the fork thing just for aesthetic, so it looks cute? Could you just plop them in if you wanted? That's actually a great question. So yeah, it, in many ways, yeah. My nonna used to just cut them like this, and then she used to just put them in the in the yeah. boiling water as is. But you actually have this little indention when you when you when you push it with on the tines of the fork that holds onto the sauce really well. Oh, hold so on. that's why I, I use the uh, mm -hmm. the tines of the fork. Anyway. 
Um, so it's it, whatever you want to do, or just come to Resdora and we'll make it for you as well. <laughs> All that right, so let me just show you the style. sauce real quick. Uh -huh. Yeah, is this uh, the sauce, sauce is going to be. Yeah, so we're doing so we have a pea puree on the base, but we have just a very very simple butter. Or if you don't use, want to use butter, you can use extra virgin olive oil. But I have a little bit of butter right here because media Romagna, we use a nice amount of butter. Uh huh. Okay. I have my gnocchi that have just been dropped in. I'm going to make sure. That as soon as it starts floating, they're ready to go. But you see that those peas that we used to have in the in the bag, or uh -huh. we have fresh frozen peas as well, which are really really nice. Yeah. Or just go to the farmer's market across the way, and you can get them there too. It's gonna go right inside with the butter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys with me? This is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> I, during this whole COVID thing, we've been so excited to have spring come again. I mean, it's just been yes. so excited. Yeah, so, so we're going crazy with the peas. We're going crazy with peas right now. Okay, so if you want to come in here, let me show you the gnocchis are floating right now. Oh, okay. And they have I'm to float. That means they're done. And then you just pour them right in that sauce. Exactly right. Okay. Going right inside the sauce right now. Okay. So you want to have a little bit of pasta water as well. Oh, I see how you do okay. that. Uh-huh. Should we show us that final product? Oh, that looks yummy. Right now, you got it. We want it. We wish it was here. Is all I can tell you. I'm gonna send some to you, Jenna. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget about me. Yes, hold and on. you hold Don't it. And you hold me. it. Sorry, sorry. Of course, both of you. Both of you. Uh, of course, both of you. Luca's actually gonna try and eat this. Luca, viene qua. Luca. Luca, do you want a bite? Hot Luca. Okay, so we have the pea puree. We have the fresh oh. pea gnocchi. Okay. Will you just give us a flash yeah, to the camera because we got us? Because sadly, it's all over. Yeah, we want more. You're a little bit. You're a little out of frame, but let's see if we can. Let's see. There oh, you go. Beautiful. That's a beauty. Tell Luca to blow My first. My camera woman's going to fire me after this. Thank she's right. she's uh, all right. Yummy. She's like, yeah. Beautiful. Delicious. Oh. Tell her we said thank you. Yes. Uh, you recipes. got it. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys so much for having us. Thanks, guys. See you soon. And for these Ciao, recipes, head to today.com slash food. Of course, it's Friday. That means it's Superfood Friday. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer sharing two delicious egg recipes that will have you scrambling to make them this weekend. <laughs> I'm going to love it. Hey, guys. I love eggs so much, and I'm excited to share with you two healthy, excellent recipes for your weekend brunch plans. First up, a veggie cheese frittata that is packed with the good stuff. I'm starting here with a dozen eggs. The majority are whole eggs, just mixed up right here, but I always like to take a few of the yolks out. Next, I'm adding in a half a cup of light sour cream. I'm all about the herbalicious flavor. You can put in whatever herbs you like. I have here chopped dill and parsley, a quarter teaspoon kosher salt, and a little bit of pepper. And I'm just gonna mix this up and now we are ready to build our frittata. I'm using onions and bell pepper. This is the point where you can make this frittata your own. And it's really important to use an oven safe skillet because when we make a frittata, it goes from stovetop right into the oven. 
This will saute over a medium flame for about five to seven minutes. We just wanna get the veggies nice and soft and lightly browned. I'm adding in some mushrooms too. I'll let this saute for another five to seven minutes. Sprinkle on top, I have some 2% sharp cheddar cheese. Slowly, I'm gonna pour my egg mixture over the cheese, which is over the vegetables. Many layers of scrumptiousness. And let this sit over the flame for about three to five minutes. Now I put the remaining cheese on top and I'm gonna let it sit over the medium flame for about three to five minutes. I just want these outer edges to slightly firm up and cook, and then I'm gonna transfer it right into the oven set at 350 for about 20 minutes. And here's our masterpiece. Guys, every bite is filled with protein, fiber, and yummy satisfaction. Now we're elevating egg salad to OMG status by giving it a cacio e pepe spin. So here I have a dozen and eggs hard boiled, some of them are whole, and a few of them I lost the yolks. And I'm just gonna chop them up using my fork. So this is nice and mixed. And now I'm adding in some light mayo. And of course, Parmesan, the star of the show. I'm gonna mix this up. And you'll see it's all coming together rich and creamy and luxurious. And to add a pop of color and some nutrition, I chopped up a bell pepper and I'm gonna add it right in. But of course, we need the ground black pepper. I tend to put in about one teaspoon, but you can continue to sort of add the pepper and taste. I like to enjoy it on a bed of leafy greens, some whole grain crackers or toast. Guys, this is good. Here's to an extra special weekend. <laughs> That looks I, I, delicious. I'm telling you that, and and the frittata is just one of the great because you can take anything that's yes. in the fridge. Leftovers. I've had like leftover green beans, and I've just thrown yeah. them in a frittata. That's really tasty. Yeah. And that looks terrific. So, uh, for more on these recipes, why don't you go to today.com/food. We're so glad to have you with us here today on The Boost. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And over the next half hour, we are spotlighting those doing life-changing work to help treat and raise awareness. We're gonna start with the Child Mind Institute, launching a new campaign to destigmatize conversations about mental health. Let's take a look. Cheers. To Wyatt. Cheers. First of all, it's great to meet you. Great to meet you, Carson. I feel like I'm in a time portal looking at me at your age. Hit me with some questions. So, like, how old were you when you first experienced anxiety? Only later in my life was I able to look back when I was a teenager and go, oh my gosh, that was all like anxiety. Like, oh, that time. Oh yeah, when I was feeling really scared and like, that's felt what like was. I was like on edge. Like, oh, that's what that was. When we were growing up, my generation, we didn't talk about mental health. Only now are we, through these conversations, starting to treat our mental health like we do our physical health. Like, no big deal. Everybody's got and mental health struggles. I think it's really important that we're doing that. 16-year-old Wyatt is like many teenagers his age. He loves playing basketball and soccer, and like many teens, he struggles with anxiety, but is speaking up in hopes of helping kids who suffer in silence. Wyatt is one of a handful of teenagers interviewing famous people about their mental health struggles to help destigmatize mental illness. Like I didn't know anxiety was like a, like a categorical <laughs> thing. I'm not a psycho, this is right. me, uh, here I'm I am. Not. When I was younger, that was it. If you had something going on up here, you were just crazy. So we've come a long, long oh, yeah. way, but we still have a lot of work to do. You know, we have all this, you know, the stigma around it, it's getting less and less and less. Why it is a part of the Child Mind yeah, Institute's really, You Got This right campaign. Back. When did you first realize that you were a little anxious? <sighs> When I was about 12, right, when I got to my new school, not just like worrying about a test the next day, it's a different kind of feeling. It's this feeling, you know, in your head that you can't kind of, you know, be yourself because you're just nonstop having this in the back of your, back of your head, just 
bugging you and bugging you. Wyatt says his anxiety began about something benign he posted on YouTube, but later grew into repeated paranoid feelings about technology. He was diagnosed with anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. My phone, which is right here, I didn't have it for a whole year because I was worried that I was being listened in on and spied on. It really, really took a toll on me. I mean, I've come really far and now here I am. There's like four cameras, my phone's right here. And you don't have that same worry? No, I'm able to have my phone around with me. And, and therapy helped you get through that? Yes. And I always had, um, we call it catastrophic thinking, negative thoughts on negative thoughts. Oh, I do that too. I've struggled with general anxiety disorder and panic attacks most of my life. Therapy has made all the difference. And that's why talking about this and like ultimately for me, you know, going to therapy, working on certain tools that help me, it's my superpower now. So it's not going to hold me back. You're saving other people with the superpower. I don't want to have a panic attack. And then I'm like, but I'm like, I'm going and I know I'm I'll be okay. It. I'm doing like, it. I know, you know? I'm going to be okay. I think I can kind of relate to that in like, I have, you know, soccer games or sometimes I feel, you know, not a panic attack, but I feel, you know, in my chest, like I'm going to throw up and it's kind of a little hard to breathe. And is it better? Like once you get into the game? Yeah. Once you're waiting for the whistle to be blown, you're out right. there, you're ready to play. And I'm sure Kevin probably has that too. Wyatt also interviewed Miami Heat's Kevin Love for the campaign. Hopefully we can help a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. It's an honor. Kevin has been very public about his own panic attacks. He's one of the reasons I opened up about mine on today. General anxiety disorder. I'm thinking like, here's Kevin Love, badass, successful, like operates the high level. Amazing. And it made me feel so good about, wow, I'm not alone. And I still perform. I can perform well at a high level, but I'm not. 30, 30 right, points. Right, exactly. Every day. I'm you're dropping averaging. a 50 biscuit on him. 50. You know what I'm saying, Wyatt? Oh my God, what a hustler. And so when I talk about mental health, I talk to young people, like, I was like, man, I was you, bro. Like, I, I know what it's like. You're not alone, man. That's the message. We're all in this together. <sighs> wow, that's really I love mean. talking it about means it. means a too. lot. It's great to hear from someone such a high power. It's right to me yeah. how I'm going to be okay. I just want to be open that I do have anxiety and OCD, you know? And yeah. so, um, that's so cool to hear, you know? Because people are going to hear that and go, oh, then it's okay if I have it. You know, like, you words, got you this. Got that's this. the message at the end. That's what I wanted to know when I struggled the most was like, was I going to be yeah, okay? Am I going to be good? Am, am I, I normal? Am I, yeah, am I normal? And the answer is yes. Yes, you are. You're okay. You're, you're normal. You're okay. And you got this. Now, September Letters, a collection of correspondence among famous friends and mental health experts that shows the power of healing through writing a letter. We all know Brittany Snow from her roles in the Pitch Perfect franchise in the 2007 film Hairspray alongside Zac Efron. Oh my God. Well, now <laughs> she, so you. she and author Jasper Guest are out with a new book. It's called September Letters. It's a guide for self-reflection and connection featuring letters from celebrities like Tom Hanks and words of inspiration from experts like Jay Shetty and they are here this morning to talk about it with us. Good morning to you guys. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. So this all started from what I understand um, from a true connection between the two of you. You met somewhere, you became friends and then was it just instant? Love at first sight? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Um, we met at a party that I was hosting and um, we just kind of really hit it off and talked about things that mattered to us and um, we really have this great connection where she picks up where I lack and vice mm. versa and so we decided to formulate a plan to do something that really mattered to us and that we could get back yeah. doing that. Let's start with the digital platform and the, the social media of it all because I understand uh, that you, you launched this letter writing project in September of, of 2020 and that of course was during this time where we were all forced to spend a great deal of time by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the letter writing project was was born from what? I mean, we always say September Letters was not born from the pandemic. We were already developing it for a few years before. It just happened to happen in September 2020 when we needed it more than ever. Um, but September Letters is a website that you can read a letter, submit a letter, write a letter. And it's the idea of acting, writing a letter that you help yourself and then you also help others. Mm. It's that full circle connection and, and that moment of strength. Mm. Which I think during the pandemic, we found out more than ever that connection and that human connection, um, whether you're not being physically with someone, but emotionally with somebody was more important than ever. So um, that's why the September Letters website really took off, I think. It's always recommended, you know, when you have stuff in your brain to journal. I find personally journaling very overwhelming. I find it intimidating, so I just don't do it. But writing a letter seems to really hit a chord with people. Why do you think that is? 
I completely agree with you. I wish that I was a journaler or I was an advocate for it. I am not. Mm -hmm. I am much more of a list maker because I think that it's overwhelming and daunting to have to feel like you're really doing that whole act. But writing a letter is much more focused because there's the self-care that it takes to actually sit down and put your mind pen to paper. and it, I think it's like the act of what is going on in your mind, sometimes that ticker tape of not knowing how to get out of it, putting it down on a piece of paper that's a focus to someone else or to yourself, it really has that sort of like through line. That you know, makes it easier. It's not only a letter, it can be a post-it note, it can be a text message, yeah. it can be a note on your iPhone. We're really big on it that it doesn't have to be a letter. We both don't really mm -hmm. journal, which is a little bit bizarre, but we don't. Um, and so it can be any form of writing, any any list. Well, it's kind of cool because it's actually a through line from the segment we just saw, we just had. I don't know if you we saw, saw it. it. We saw we it. With the it. Notes. And I thought it was fun that some of your Pitch Perfect co-stars wrote Pitch, or, uh, um, post a note, some of them full letters, so they got involved too. Yeah, some of my friends took the time to write some beautiful letters and really share their soul. And then we got all the girls together and they wrote post it notes about what they were grateful for. And I think it was really telling that most of them said that we were grateful for our friendship. Mm -hmm. It matters. Um, but it does matter, it does. And especially when we were going through a lot during the pandemic. I think yeah. we all really learned that, you know, friendship is family. Yeah. I love that. Beyond that, professionally, really quickly before we let you go, South by Southwest, mm -hmm. directorial debut. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. I two, get a plug. Two, two awards. Yes. Two awards. Award. Yes, you won awards. Starring in a Christmas movie. Yes, I'm in a Christmas movie that's out. <laughs> in direct, well, it'll be out uh, Christmas. But yes, Parachute, um, I co wrote and directed it, and um, it won a bunch of awards at South by Southwest, also about mental health. So um, it, was, it was really nice. What's the premise? Yeah. It's about a girl going through um, a mental health challenge and she meets a guy who is also a codependent and they fall in love and it's really about learning how to love yourself when you're trying to love also someone else. Mm. That's true. Great. Things have never been said. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, Thank okay. you so much Thank for joining guys. us. Congratulations. Thank September you. Letters is out today and available now. Just ahead, a story all parents and young people do need to see. An inside look at a college course that's all about helping students discuss and improve their mental well-being. Stay with us. on the boost with a new kind of college class that's already spread to more than 20 campuses across the country. So it teaches students a fundamental life skill, how to become resilient. Today's college students have lived through a lot. The pandemic disrupted their education. In the 2020 to 2021 school year, more than 60% of college students met the criteria for at least one mental health problem. And there just aren't enough counselors on campuses to go around. But in this classroom at Pace University in New York, a new approach. Like, you're not your thoughts. Right. Like, I'm not my emotions. I'm not my it's called Radical Health, an elective at Pace. Once a week, for four weeks, students talk openly about their mental well-being. I tell myself the fact that I'm looking for motivation means that it's there somewhere. Week one is about the importance of making connections with other students. Week two, setting priorities. Stress management, building resilience, and self-care are taught in week three. And the last week is about looking forward and making good decisions. 
anything else? What can we do going forward? Sophomore Stephanie Spruck is the student guide for this group. This is different than therapy because it's peer-led. You are hearing from peers who are like you. The whole point is to teach students skills so they can get ahead of problems. They also make sure people know where to turn for help on campus. They're equipped to cope before they reach a crisis point. Liz Feld is CEO of Radical Hope, the foundation that funds the program. Young people all around the country have shared with us that they are missing two things in their lives, meaningful connections, and resilient skills to power through the regular challenges that we all experience every day in our lives. 19-year-old freshman Anaya Zayas lost her mom during the pandemic. She says the connections she's made here helped her realize she's not alone. Going through that with COVID and with, you know, being isolated, in this group we talked a lot about getting to know ourselves to help ourselves, you know. I've started to let myself feel like my grief and my pain. Olivia Rich is a junior who transferred to Pace. I think the program has helped just kind of create a toolbox for me because it's teaching you many areas like awareness, affirmations, you know, self-talk, and I think all those things are really important to have. The program has already reached more than 10,000 students, and a whopping 95% said they would recommend Radical Health to a friend, a place to build strength. Y'all have just been a huge life support system for me. And make friends in the process. According to a study out of Ohio State University, doing kind things for others may help you. We talked to researchers who are looking into the awe-inspiring power of simple kindness. A compliment to a stranger, buying a coworker coffee, shoveling a neighbor's snowy driveway. We all know an act of kindness when we see one, but what you may not know? New research published in the Journal of Positive Psychology suggests doing kind things for others may help you feel better too. I kept coming across social connection seems to be one of the most powerful ingredients for flourishing in life. That idea inspired a new project out of Ohio State University. Dr. David Craig and Dr. Jennifer Chevins lead a team of researchers on kindness. They asked people who reported feeling anxious and depressed to perform three small acts of kindness two days a week, every week for the five-week study. Participants did things like bake cookies for friends, smile at strangers, and volunteer. The results were dramatic. Folks who participated in the Acts of Kindness group reported that they felt less depressed, less anxious. Study participants also reported feeling more connected to others and more satisfied with their lives. Participants felt such benefit that 75% of them continued doing Acts of Kindness even after the study ended. There just seems to be something about having social connection that brings meaning and purpose into our lives. Without it, um, everything else just kind of feels empty. Ohio State senior Abby Arntz discovered healing through helping too. How is the CA going? She wasn't part of the kindness study, but she took a class with Dr. Chevins last year. One of her assignments was to do kind things for others. So Abby started going out of her way to hold the door. Go ahead. Yeah, have a great day. Giving out compliments to strangers. Hey, I should say your shoes are really cool and writing positive affirmations on sticky notes around campus. As someone who is fairly anxious myself, I was a little hesitant, but as soon as I actually started giving the compliments and holding doors, I felt this reassurance. I have this power to brighten people's days and uh, make a positive impact on others. Something Abby learned, as did so many others. Kindness can be a prescription for anyone and everyone. Have a great day. And it doesn't cost you a thing. Wow, so many great takeaways from that study. And here to help us break it all down is Dr. Kojo Sarfo. He's a psychotherapist. He shares his wisdom with his three million followers on social media. He's also the author of a book. It's called Feeling Good, a mental health workbook. Dr. Sarfo, we knew that doing kind things kind of makes you feel good in a moment, but right. I, I just didn't know it had such long-term effects on you. Yeah, it's uh, one of the most powerful things that you can do, and it's so practical. And for those who are struggling with depression and or anxiety who may feel hopeless and helpless just having that connection with people it goes a long way it's a connection but it's also a sense of purpose right. and yeah. meaning which exactly. is so often when you're depressed or anxious you you don't feel that mm -hmm. yeah exactly and when you talk about you know um, 
having a sense of purpose is so powerful to do something for somebody else because when you do that you realize that oh people do appreciate me people enjoy having me here on the planet and when you're depressed and you're hopeless uh -huh. you sometimes forget that well it's all about connection I feel like even if you make a connection with a stranger right. or something I remember this one stranger one time gifted me a, um, a cupcake and I remember it, it was 10 yeah. years ago and I remember it to this day because she left it behind after I admired them once and it, it stays it stays with you exactly and sometimes we forget the impact that we have on people. And when you go out and you compliment somebody about their shoes or you say, I like your cupcakes or I like your dress, yeah. it's going to improve your confidence. And the likelihood that they're going to give you a negative reaction is very low. And you may have made a new friend. Welcome back to The Boost as we mark Mental Health Awareness Month. Often in communities of color, access to mental health resources is just out of reach. So one inspiring teacher came up with a creative way to bring in those desperately needed resources. Whenever you decide to go to therapy, whatever you do, you want to know the questions to ask to find the right therapist for you. But a lot of times we don't know the questions to ask. For BJ Williams, mental health is a calling. So BJ, your friends and family know you as the mental health guy, huh? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the mental health guy. <laughs> My initial intro into therapy was actual couples therapy with a girlfriend. In, in During that time, my older brother died by suicide. And I left that relationship and a week later got into individual therapy. Why do you think people aren't forthcoming about going to therapy? There's a stigma behind it, specifically, uh, especially, not specifically, especially in, in black and brown communities, especially amongst men. And so it's one of those things that, that are, you know, stigmatized and that we're afraid to say because, like, it's either you're crazy, you're on pills, or we write it off. But instead of writing it off, BJ kept the conversation going. As a teacher at Jefferson High School in South Central Los Angeles, he saw his students struggling with their mental health. I'm in the underserved, you know, what would be considered a uh, poverty level community at a, at a high school that's one of the oldest high schools in LA. Um, and I know this, that the makeup of the, uh, of the school is mainly Hispanic Latina. We lack uh, resources here, you know, we lack school materials here, we lack a bunch of things. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, black Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health issues, but are less likely to receive mental health help. And more than half of Hispanic young adults with serious mental illness may not receive treatment. There is still that family stigma that the kids themselves probably recognize that their parents or their guardians probably are still on the, the, the stigma of you can't be crazy, we can't afford to be crazy, that's for white people, we, you know what I mean, like we don't have access, that kind of thing. I'm reading your shirt, but tell me about that. 
Can I be vulnerable? What's the what's the history with that? Can I be vulnerable is my mental health platform. Uh, it started off as a uh, docu series. Actually, um, I recorded about fifty plus black men, and I let just them just talk about their mental and emotional health journey with a very personal story. Can I be vulnerable? Yes, you can. Will you be vulnerable? Well, you should. Uh, we did that for like a year and a half, and then it kind of evolved into some other things. Um, we created a curriculum for high school students. He launched the Can I Be Vulnerable bus in March. Its first stop, Jefferson High School. How did the bus come about? I was thinking how to further do the work. And I was like, I don't, why don't you just taco truck this thing? Why don't you just bring the people? It was a very simple concept. How about I put mental health professionals on a bus and take them to the community like the ice cream man? So we provide the community with questions to go on the bus and interview a mental health professional. So that way, when they're ready to embark on their own journey, they at least have some knowledge on what questions to ask. When you were done with your event at Jefferson, did you hear back specifically from any students? What did they tell you? They liked it, one. <laughs> they felt it was needed, too. But more specifically, they do plan on going on a mental health journey. Since its launch, BJ's Mental Wellness Bus has made more stops around Southern California and Las Vegas. BJ plans on keeping those conversations and his bus rolling. That's the thing about it. If you build it, they will get there eventually. But I do think the future of it is bright. I do think this can be something that can go worldwide, honestly. This next story features another creative way that mental health resources are reaching communities in need. It is a new tool helping students manage their mental health by speaking their language using emojis. Take a look. School is about to start. Hi, and in that chaos, parents rarely have time to quiz their kids with a simple question. How are you feeling today? The answer could be anything from happy to sad, anxious to angry. Let's welcome this wonderful day by reaching our arms up, big stretch. Here at the Green School in West Palm Beach, Florida, after everyone loosens up the body, there is a moment set aside for a mental stretch and time to check in on the WellCheck app, which allows kids to check in on themselves. Can you read that word? Using emojis. Excited, scared, calm, happy. They may also write short narratives, sometimes upsetting moments they don't want to say out loud. It's like confidential, so maybe one of your friends did something behind your back, but you found out about it. Putting it on here could help, and then that way you can talk to somebody about it. First grader Ava McDermott began using WellCheck last year. I feel, I feel great because then people get to know how you're feeling. And why is that important? Because if like you're feeling sad or something, you can tell somebody and they can help you out feel better. Kindergartners, members of that digital native generation, tell so an entire doing? story with just emojis. By starting this routine so young, researchers believe it allows kids to learn Openly expressing emotions is normal. Many schools focus on academics being a priority. Um, for me personally and professionally, the academics is secondary. Um, the primary focus should be on the mental health because as we know as adults, if we're not mentally strong, we're not going to be productive. The app allows kids to express themselves confidentially on a computer. A teacher only knows who's having problems if a student clicks check on me or check on a friend. It makes me aware ahead of time so I can kind of come up with a game plan of how I'm going to approach this child. Maybe at recess, it's as small as calling them over to sit with me on the bench and just say, would you like to talk about it further? And why is that so important with kids at these ages? Students who maybe wouldn't feel comfortable voicing their, their feelings out loud have become more comfortable doing so. Fourth grader Victoria Brask says anonymity is critical. Like sometimes I feel a little bit shy when other people are like um, when I'm talking to them because sometimes they say stuff that back and I, I just get sometimes nervous. Do you feel sometimes like you're being judged if you talk to a person? Yes. The digital tool was created by researchers at Johns Hopkins University and is currently in pilot phase in 42 U.S. schools and two outside of the U.S. When students have this sense of connectedness to teachers and schools, they're more likely to have a greater sense of self-determination and 
and autonomy, and that helps with engagement and motivation and ultimately achievement. After remote learning, some parents say the anonymous data tells a still unfolding post-pandemic mental health story. Young people did not do well being so isolated. There is a realization that schools made that they have to take the time and listen to the kids in that respect. In our idealized, simpler days, school was reading, writing, and arithmetic. But mental health counselors say today's kids are under more pressure than ever. And learning to deal with that is as important as two plus two. This is necessary. It's not just something we do in the morning because we have to do it. It has a true purpose. We've got another uplifting story you do not want to miss coming up right after the break. the boost and we couldn't leave you without that one last feel-good video check it out a college graduate named Vicki was already having one of the most memorable days of her life just moments after getting her diploma she was surprised by her best friend secretly made the trip to Eastern Illinois University to help Vicki celebrate her big day however the surprises did not end there her day got even better watch what happens next <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what we call a trifecta. Graduation, best friend surprise, and now a marriage proposal. A lifetime of memories in one day. You can hear Vicky saying, I think I'm going to pass out. Um, she said yes. The crowd and friends, like, just cheered her on. Damn. So many things to celebrate on that. Yes. Oh, you well, could forget. pass out of joy. Why yeah. not? Oh, so sweet. Thank you so much for joining us today as we hope to raise awareness around mental health. Make sure you take some extra care of yourself and check in on your loved ones. We will see you tomorrow right here on Today All Day. Thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. Learn how to sell your home quicker at asking price, if not higher. Reduce your energy bill. And why you need to think twice about giving out your email. It's all coming your way. But first, a warning about a potential danger for drivers and pedestrians. Ultra bright headlights that can lead to accidents. And what you need to do now to stay safe on the road. Social media is filled with photos and videos of blinding headlights. I can't even see. I'm like literally getting blinded from the guy's headlights behind me. Watch these close calls apparently caused by the glare. This driver barely misses that pedestrian. Another near collision with an oncoming car and this crash into a down tree. The light does look much brighter. John Bolo is a scientist who studies lighting for the Mount Sinai School of Medicine's Light and Health Research Center. He says older headlights use halogen bulbs, which have a softer orange color, but newer ones are bluish white. You're creating a lot of glare for those other drivers. And a potentially dangerous situation. That's right. Bulla showed us the difference firsthand with an older halogen headlamp and a newer LED, both emitting the same amount of light. I'm going to look at the warm light just to 
kind of get a sense. Okay, yeah, it's bright. Let me see what the LED light does. Oh, this one for sure, much, much brighter. It hurts my eyes and actually I'm still seeing the spots from it. Why is it that they appear brighter? Well, our eyes are more sensitive to blue light. He says the issue is magnified when a headlight is out of alignment, a common problem. An NBC News analysis found only 10 states require annual inspections that check to see that headlights are aligned correctly, pointing straight out and down. Bulla shifts an LED headlight out of alignment by just a few degrees to show me what can happen on the road. Wow, so the LEDs are already quite bright, but when they're tilted up, you can't see anything else. This would be very dangerous if I were driving. He says another contributing factor, large trucks and SUVs, which made up 75% of all vehicle sales last year. Those taller vehicles mean headlights are higher and more likely to shine directly into the eyes of a driver in a smaller, lower vehicle. I couldn't see for five to ten seconds. Aaron Madrid totaled his Chevy Sonic in November when he says an oncoming pickup truck blinded him. By the time I was able to see, I had swerved into incoming traffic and then I ended up in a tree. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt. It just felt like lights out. But Ashanti Collins wasn't so lucky. She says in May 2021, the lights from an oncoming vehicle led to her crash. Was it just totally blinding? Yes, I couldn't see anything. That was the only thing I seen before I woke up on the side of the road in my car. She had to be airlifted to a hospital to treat a broken arm and dislocated wrist. When you looked at the pictures of your car, did you think it was a miracle that you survived that crash? Yes, definitely. Looking at the car, it was just insane. Experts and automakers agree the primary solution to this glaring problem is something called adaptive headlight technology. Right now, it's only available on test vehicles here in the U.S., but I'm going to show you how it works. I'm here in Virginia at the Audi U.S. headquarters to show you what the future of driving at night might look like. Audi's head of product management, Philip Brabeck, what did these lights do? Well, instead of thinking of a static light like a low beam and a high beam, think of it as a projector. There's 1.3 million micro mirrors in each headlight that create this image. And it's not blinding other people. And it's not blinding other people. I get behind the wheel to see for myself. Wow, I can see yep. everything. <laughs> this experience of driving at night is completely different and so much better. I feel like a safer driver. Notice these arrows on the pavement. It's helping you stay within the lanes. As I pull onto the highway, the lights highlight my lane without affecting other drivers. Okay, so this so car- So now he got in. Got in front of me. And notice how it's got a shadow on him now. Yeah. Oh, interesting. But the real light show takes place on this dark, windy road. It almost feels like magic because of the amount of light that is being cast all over. I'm not used to seeing that as a driver. I switch cars so I can see what it's like to drive toward the test car with adaptive headlights. His high beams are on. Yes. But they're not a problem for me. Yep. Whereas this car behind him with the LEDs is quite bright. Yes. It's remarkable to see the difference. Do you think this technology is life-saving? Absolutely. Adaptive headlights have been in use in Europe and several other countries for about a decade now. But automakers and safety experts here say red tape in the United States means it could be years before we see this technology allowed on cars here. So in the meantime, you want to drive slowly at night. Look toward the right-hand edge of the road to avoid glaring lights. And if you suspect your headlights are out of alignment, you can actually check to see if one light is higher than the other when you pull into your garage or point your car towards a wall. Even an inch or two can mean a major misalignment 100 feet down the road. And don't forget to check with your mechanic. They should be able to easily realign your headlights. It's not just road safety that's become a hot topic. Retailers have also started tightening their refund policies and charging additional fees. This is all according to the National Retail Federation. Americans returned $816 billion worth of merchandise in 2022. So how do we avoid those extra fees? Here's how you can make your returns easier and cheaper. So, Vicki, it used to be when you bought something online, you didn't like it, it was a simple, easy return. But is that not the case so much anymore? Things are definitely changing, Hoda. Once upon a time, when we were nervous about going online to buy something, what is this, the internet shopping? Retailers were like, look, we're going to make it so easy for you. We're going to ship it to you for free. You can return it to us for no fee. It'll be just like going to a brick and mortar. Fast forward 15, 20 years, and now we are doing that gangbusters. But it's not free to the retailer when you 
process a return. It's anywhere from right. 15 to $20 minimum. And we talk about 16.5% of all online purchases go back. And there's a real cost. And now retailers are trying to claw that back. A recent survey by GoTRG shows 60% of retailers are reconfiguring their return policies in one way or another. Oh. It did almost feel like they, they did want you to. Yes. Like, go oh, yeah. try it on at home, send Absolutely. it back, sure. no problem. Well, times they are a change in. So what are some of the new rules and pitfalls yeah. we should work out? Okay, for? PBP. It's not a one. thing. I, I admit to you, it? I am making this up. Pause before purchasing. Yes. Oh. The less you buy, the less you're going to return. This is a good time, though, to check your favorite retailer's return policies because odds are something may have changed. And then when you get that item, if you're not positive you want it, Make sure you keep it in original packaging. Try it on without makeup or perfume on mm. because if you return mm. it, it needs to be in sellable condition. So much of these returns ends up in a landfill. So oh. it's wasteful. Even if you oh. get your money back, it's very wasteful and there's a cost to the environment. All that shipping, that carbon footprint of sending you something, That's you boxing point. it up, sending it back. So those are things you need to keep in mind. And if you go to return in store, always bring your ID and your original form of payment. That just helps to expedite the Somebody return. Somebody said wait P one. P someone said wait one week. If you're going to buy something online that's not Urgent. Yeah. Yes. If you look back in your little basket and it's a week later and yeah. it's still there and you need it, then get it. But sometimes but I you get a discount it. too. Yes, yeah. Greg, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you get a coupon I listen to you, Nikki. Yes. I listen I to you. Uh -huh. So let's look at the policies of some of the country's largest stores. Okay, let's start with Target. Target allows you 90 days to return almost anything except for electronics. Then it's 30 days. But if you have a Target red card, you have up to 120 days to return. Now, Amazon is the interesting one. It's always mm. been 30 days, free returns, as easy as possible. But you do want to pay attention because there are so many third-party sellers on Amazon yeah. and sometimes their return policies are different. Oh. Also, they're starting to implement, according to the information, a $1 return fee. So if you go to UPS to return something to Amazon, yeah. but there's a Kohl's or a Whole Foods that's closer to you, they will charge you a dollar on that item to return. And finally, Walmart, it's 90 days. In person, uh, in store, same, they have a shorter return window for electronics. But those are the big, big companies and their policies as of now. What about like Nordstrom always had like the best return? You don't like it, you take it back. Do retailers have their own things too? Definitely. Yeah. For example, Zara, $3.95 to return an item. Uh, JCPenney, $8. But if you go to the brick and mortar, as with most retailers, mm. it's usually free mm. if you're not shipping it back to them. Uh, the other thing is loyalty programs. So DSW, which is designed Mm -hmm. shoe warehouse mm -hmm. and H&M if you return an item online uh, b mm. by mail there is a fee but if you're a member of the loyalty program oh. it's free so oh. it really pays to look at the fine print to see if you should sign up but again PBP pause before purchase. Like PBP. You know up next tips to help you save on your energy bill this summer and later how to protect your online privacy and avoid pitfalls that's all ahead on consumer confidential with Consumer and Confidential. Summer is here, and that means higher energy bills are also on the way. The good news, there are simple ways to save big 
on your bills. Well, let's talk about some ways to maximize the efficiency. I mean, I was AC. talking about some of these places in the country on the West Coast hitting the 90s. So yeah. the, when's the last time you checked your air conditioning unit it's, to see if it was clean, uh, unclogged, right? We just let that thing go and go. It needs to be inspected. It needs to be cleaned out. Now is the time before it gets really busy and the summer kicks in. The next thing is think about your thermostat. What do you have next to the thermostat? Is there a TV next to it, a lamp? That thing is giving out heat and it's triggering your thermostat to keep the AC uh, running uh, longer. So make sure you move any Anything hot away from your thermostat. Huh. And then we talk about strategic planting. Think about your landscaping. If this is the time to put in some new trees and shrubs, what can you do to shade your air conditioning unit? Just make oh, sure the you're unit. Not, yeah, the unit okay. itself, right? You don't want um, a, a messy bush, though, sure. that's going to drop things onto it. And the other thing is think about the hottest part of your house, the, the part that faces the south and west. If you can plant some trees that will provide shade, that's going to cut down on your AC bill by 10%. Huh. At least. Really? Yeah. Landscaping. It's a huh? big difference. Strategic landscaping. So let's go inside now. Let's talk about some ways, some tips to keep the inside of your house a little cooler for less. Fans are your friend. A yeah. fan uses 1 60th the amount of energy as an air conditioning unit. So use it in conjunction with your AC. And every degree that you can keep your AC above 75 degrees, you're saving another 15% on your electricity. You mean ceiling bill. fans? Ceiling fans or even floor fans. Oh, okay. mm, or table fans. Any kind of fan that can help move the air around. It's not going to cool the air, but it will draw the body heat away from your skin and make you feel cooler. Oh. The other thing that's very simple is to buy some caulking or weather stripping to seal any cracks yeah. that are in your walls. And then if you've got like gaps underneath your door or around your windows, get the weather stripping. It's yeah. a very inexpensive fix at the hardware store. Finally, if you can keep your blinds closed during the hottest parts of the day, you're going to reduce heat gain by 45%, 33% if you keep your drapes closed. So that's a simple one. If you want sunlight, go outside. That's These expensive. things add up. I mean, yeah. between the, you know, right. anyway. Exactly. Okay, I didn't realize this. A lot of electricity companies charge different rates for peak use hours. They really do, and it depends on where you live and the season. So you want to look that up on your energy company's website or give them a call. Generally, between two and six is when you want to avoid using your large appliances, your okay. dishwasher, your washer and dryer. Use it after 6 p.m. or on the weekends. The other thing we don't think about, unplug those little appliances, the chargers, everything that you have, Plugged in, you call don't them vampire use. devices. Yes, they're slowly sucking the <laughs> juice out of the the electricity system and causing your electric bill to go up. Those incandescent bulbs, think about how many light bulbs you have in your yeah. house, lamps in the ceiling. Switch everything to LED. Not only does an LED bulb last 25,000 hours compared to just 1,200 hours for an incandescent bulb, but those older bulbs, they're just emitting heat, yeah, which also hot. makes your house hotter. Yeah. And they cost three times as much to run. All right, so switch to LED. I didn't realize this. Our water heaters yeah. in our homes are responsible for like a fifth of our bill? Yeah, 18% of your mm -hmm. annual energy bill comes from your water heater. This is, I was going to ask you, Craig, from the last time, you remember I what remember degree you you're me. supposed to set yes, it at. And I didn't know then. <laughs> I've never and, even looked at it. But you ours. do now, 120 <laughs> degrees. I was going to say 120 degrees. Perfect, right on the money. You learned something from the last <laughs> segment. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission says not only is this safer, it's going to prevent anybody from being scalded by hot water, but it's more energy efficient. The other thing, only run a full load of laundry. I'm sure we know this by now. And use cold water unless you have really heavily soiled clothes. The last part is use the sun. At least start drying some of your clothes outside. And maybe if you don't like how crispy they get, mm -hmm. throw them in the dryer for the last five or ten minutes to fluff them back up. Okay. But use the sun. Use the outdoors All to help these you. Things to help. So yeah. you know with the credit cards, for example, yeah. you'll say, just call. Just ask for a discount. Apparently with this, maybe you can try that. Is thing. that true? Always ask for a discount no matter where <laughs> and you are. And then they hang up on situation. you. No, and this is the thing. Your energy provider has um, programs to help you with income. And that also is true. folks with disabilities yep. can qualify for some of these programs. The other thing is a lot a lot of companies want to encourage you to weatherize your home, install Energy Star appliances. We bought some uh, light bulbs through Con Ed, which is here in New York, mm -hmm. and the light bulbs were like 25 cents each. So there are programs that can save you up to $500 or more on your energy bill. Okay. Vicky Wynn. I know. Great tips. Save almost 30%. She, with she's like things. an encyclopedia. We'll take it. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Thanks, Vic. Yep. Coming up, what you need to know to make it harder for advertisers to track you online, plus how to cut down on subscriptions and save more money. We're back right after this.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. Give up your email and get a discount. Well, it sounds simple, but did you know your email is a valuable key to unlocking a lot of personal information? Here's what you should consider before sharing that email. This is a common site on most websites, pop-up windows, asking you to enter your email address to get a discount. But it might not be worth it. Your email connects companies to a treasure trove of information that can stretch back decades. What you read, where you shop, your age, marital status, sexual orientation, medical history, income, even where you traveled and lived, all pieces of information that come together to reveal your personal profile. I've had my email longer than I've had my phone number. And, and, and that's a reality for a lot of folks. Patrick Jackson is a cybersecurity expert with Disconnect, an online privacy company. Your email address is a lot more valuable than probably people think it is. It may contain your first and last name, your uh, birthday, who you work for, what school you go to. He says as Apple and Google add more ways for you to block apps from tracking you, and as more consumers say no to cookies, not those cookies, these cookies, advertisers and brands are now asking you directly for your email. It's something that consumers really don't, they don't understand that this is really the glue that connects all these pieces of information together. And when you open an email, that can give advertisers even more info about you. Jackson showed me how it works in real time. Okay, so I got an email that says shoe sale. Is that for me? Yep, that's for you. All right, I'm gonna open it. He hit a tracker in this banner advertisement, and the moment I open it, he learns a lot about me. Just from you opening this email, I can get um, your location, uh, which is New York, New York. You're connecting from an iPhone. You're uh, using the Outlook app on your device, the time when you open it, and if you opened it again. Why should I care that you know all that about me? It's not clear that it's happening. It creates this, this beast that we no longer have control over once this data is collected. And where does all that data go? Patrick says it often ends up with so-called data brokers that might collect and sell it to people like Michael Prem, the CEO of Modern Impact, an advertising agency that helps brands target their customers. Prem says some of this data collection helps consumers by giving them a better online experience. What's the benefit to the consumer? The benefit to the consumer is actually receiving ads that enrich or create a better digital experience. There's no way to remove all advertising from our digital ecosystem. But Prem also advocates for consumer privacy and enforcement of privacy laws. The balance then for brands is making sure that they don't breach our privacy, where they don't come across as stalkerish. Do you think there's a world where you can have both? A consumer can protect their data and have their privacy and still have ads and an experience online that is relevant to them? I sure hope so. While it's not perfect, I think the the goal for many smart advertising brands are to continue to enrich that experience, not to hijack it. And it's not just your email, but your phone number too. That allows businesses to text you and target you for ads. And the more your phone number is out there, the greater a chance it could be part of a data breach, which would make you a bigger target for robocalls and spam texts. And just like mailing lists, it can also be hard to keep track of monthly subscriptions. Those can easily add up. But there are some simple steps you can take to trim down your expenses. We all have that list of subscriptions we're paying for, from TV and music streaming to meal plans and fitness apps. HBO Max, Netflix and Hulu, Spotify, I think gym memberships. Charged automatically each month, whether we remember them or not. And as the Wall Street Journal recently reported, they add up. In a 2022 survey, respondents estimated they spent $86 a month on subscriptions. The actual average amount, $219. And it was far more for Lakeisha Mosley. The pandemic really put us all financially in a tizzy. And so I was going through trying to establish a budget. She found a plethora of forgotten subscriptions. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm paying for this and I'm paying for that including a recurring class pass membership that was costing her about $1,000 a year. I could count on one hand the time I signed in, maybe once or twice. Mosley added up over $700 a month in subscription charges. She ended up canceling more than half. Subscribers like her are saying enough is enough. Cancellations for Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, and others rose about 50% in 2022 from the previous year. Are subscriptions one of those easy things to forget about because they're automatic? 
Absolutely. Your subscriptions are so often, they're small amounts. So sometimes we forget about them. $5, $6, $12 a month. And a proposed rule from the Federal Trade Commission would crack down on companies, ordering them to make it as easy to cancel as it was to sign up. They need to tell you how long the trial period goes for, clearly have to tell you by when you have to cancel. The FTC plan is now up for public comment. Meanwhile, there are a variety of apps that can help you keep track of expenses and flag subscriptions you may have forgotten. I realized I was paying for two Netflix accounts and two Spotify accounts. Dustin Hensley used the app Rocket Money to identify duplicate payments and a mystery $300 annual charge that he got refunded. What advice would you give to other consumers having gone through your experience? Pay attention. You get nickel and dime. It's death by a thousand cuts. If you don't want to use another app to track your subscriptions, you can streamline your payments so they are easier to track. For example, use your most used credit or debit card and set up alerts on your phone for when those charges hit. Then you'll see that. You'll be reminded that you are still paying for subscriptions. Still to come, staging your home can pay off getting it off the market quicker and at the price you're asking for or even more. Next, the tricks to make your house a hot property when consumers Consumer Confidential returns. Welcome back. It is a tricky market for home buyers and sellers right now with high mortgage rates causing a dip in sales. But staging your home can make all the difference and the right changes can even get your home sold above asking price. The best part, you don't have to spend a fortune. All the world's a stage, including your home when it's time to sell. With existing home sales down nearly 23% from last year, some homeowners now opting to set the scene for potential buyers, giving their spaces a mini makeover before putting them on the market. We staged the main living areas. We also repainted a lot of walls, but more importantly, massively decluttered the house. From a fresh coat of paint and unobstructed windows to updated furniture and floor coverings, a recent survey finding 81% of buyer's agents said staging made it easier for a buyer to visualize a property as their future home. We sort of have to move the seller out a little bit in order to help the buyer feel like they can move in. Stacy Esser, a real estate agent in New Jersey who runs her own staging company, says most homes don't need a full renovation to attract buyers. Small changes can welcome a big return sellers spending an average of $400 to $600 on staging. You've seen it time and again that when you put in a little investment up front, that increases the sales price of the home? Yeah, you will actually sell your house for more money every single time. Esser says staged homes also sell faster. This listing under contract in one weekend for $126,000 above the asking price. And when the average home spent 160 days on the market in his neighborhood, the owner of this home, staged by Esser, says he accepted an offer in less than a month. What is today's buyer looking for? So today's buyer is looking for more flexible spaces, open floor plans, great storage, work at home, places they can work out, and more informal family time spaces. Esser says wherever the eye rests, the sale begins. You really want to help a buyer envision themselves in that space. 
the most important rooms to stage, the living room, the primary bedroom, and the kitchen. So this is a house coming on the market, actually, this weekend. Esser taking us on a tour of this home's dramatic before and after. One of the things that we start with is always to take any heavy window treatments off mm -hmm. and to really just let that sunshine in. This would-be formal living room recently painted a neutral color ahead of its transformation into a more casual, flexible space. Tell me what you did in here. So first of all, I think what we did is we just made the room feel a lot larger and created multiple seating areas in this really large space. What can you do in the kitchen to tidy it up and make it more appealing to buyers? So one of the easiest things we can do is basically help a seller declutter a kitchen. Esther's recipe for a market-ready kitchen? Clear the counters, swap out bulky furniture, and accessorize with pops of color using items you already have in your fridge or pantry. You really jazzed up the kitchen. Yeah, we totally did. It's inexpensive and anybody could do this. These are actual just vegetables. And we like to use this cookbook to make it feel like somebody was just here cooking. And just switching out the table made a big difference. You combine the round table with the pop of white mm -hmm. and it really lightens up the space. And upstairs, Esther's team reverting this den back into a kid's bedroom. Bedrooms help sell houses. When it comes to staging, it's not just what's on the inside that counts. First impressions matter too. Don't forget about the outside. Make sure your home has curb appeal. There should be flowers planted outside. People should trim their hedges. People should make sure that their lawns are taken care of. Simple touches to help prepare your home for showtime. Esther says the best time to sell is when interest rates go down. She encourages you, if you are thinking about selling, to start your decluttering process now. For example, take down the family photos like this. See how much cleaner and clearer it looks? Next, you're gonna wanna remove any drapes to allow some more natural light to shine into those windows. It makes a big difference. And if you have a busy wallpaper, you wanna change that to a neutral color, maybe paint it to liven up and clear out your home. This is all gonna help interested buyers imagine themselves living in your space. That's our time for now. Thanks so much for watching. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Ow. Hi, good to see oh, you again. It's been a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate 
about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? You know, it's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis, setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek. Now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history from national to Kirby's, to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island, to L. George's, to Leo's, and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people who got a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. We're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments people about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. 
But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously, but I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soderopoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you nailed everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learn how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Hey. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get a pork, beef, and a and that's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. And That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. Yes, you know, there's just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right. So we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay. Give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek fiat. Yeah, That's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across. There you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. I get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. Little All more. Right. It's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Boom. 
All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the there. chili to go yeah, in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it. Yeah. I want that chili. Don't chintz out on Get that chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy. Right. Exactly. A mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, and just like me, it was, it was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance 
pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory, you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done.
Chili, mustard, onion. And what happens if you reverse <laughs> it? Oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were going to open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant, and it was going to be a vegan restaurant, and I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents, and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager, and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior, to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to it would as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you're know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? For this chili? is Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? 
I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give it a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> So then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard and we're still struggling and fighting and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. I that is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. Good Wednesday morning, a major change in the 2024 presidential race. Ron DeSantis finally throwing his hat in the ring. It's May 24th. This is today. Off and running. America has been worth it every single time. After months of speculation, Florida's Republican governor set to officially announce his White House bid today, surprising the political world by doing it on 